this is <laughs> there was too much awkward silence silence yeah oh, I, I understand i understand i have to say something <laughs> so coach walsh i see you uh got the whiteboard you're gonna take us to school you're gonna show us some x's and o's you're gonna you're gonna uh, break out some of your signature plays for us no i'm just trying to look official Oh, <laughs> if you saw the back side of this wall. It's an ugly yellow that needs something on it that my players give me heck about. So <laughs> this just as coach coach Jay and I were talking about earlier, he says, well, oh, you looking official. I said, yeah, well, we'll, we'll stop there. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but he had me doing that earlier. Didn't expect it, but he, he made use of it. Okay. It, it kind of <laughs> came out. It kind of came out of the blue. <laughs> All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm already got a streaming live on um, Facebook, so we'll go ahead and make use of our time. And as people add in, they'll jump in there as, when they can. All right, thank you all for um, joining in to this um, coaches clinic. I'm just trying to make sure we can give back to the game. We have a nothing but a bunch of time on our hands. Um, I plan to make this a series, probably do another one in about a, another week or two, just so we can keep giving back to the game until they release us to the outside world. I am Coach Jay. My real name is Jamal Brown. Um, it's good to have my good friend Katie Pate on. Um, that's That's been one of my uh, mentors and helping through the game. Um, so we got a pretty good lineup of coaches um, and Everybody knows what they're going to talk about, so I'll let them introduce themselves. But the first coach is up is Coach D, Coach Danielle Johnson, and everybody else is muted, and you can go for it, Coach Johnson. Okay. Well, um, good evening, everyone. And um, first, I want to thank Coach Jay for this opportunity. Um, I appreciate you letting me be one of the presenters tonight, and uh, hopefully, you know, we're going to share some good information and um what I'm sharing tonight is nothing that's going to be mind blowing or, you know, something that you, people haven't heard before for us veteran coaches that have been out there for a while. It's going to pretty much serve as a reminder. Um, it's going to mm -hmm. be a, a refresher. Maybe some of the stuff that you did five, 10 years ago, now it's time to bring it back. Uh, for some of the newer coaches, if you're a high school coach and this is your first time coaching a varsity team, I'm probably going to lay down the foundation and give you some structure. So that's what I'm kind of digging in tonight. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, I do go by Coach Danielle or Coach D. Um, I was um, born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. I uh, went to Bishop Borges High School where I won a state championship in basketball. I played for the Aquinas College Saints in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I was coached by Hall of Fame NAIA coach Patty Tabaldi. Um, after leaving Aquinas and graduating, I played in a semi-pro league for a short time, and uh, I'm in my 25th year of coaching. I started coaching when I was a senior in high school, and every year after I would come home from college in the summers, I'd be working basketball camps and coaching AAU, and um, fast forward, um, after I got done with my degree and I wanted to come back to the Detroit area, I got a job at my high school at Bishop Borges and I was the varsity volleyball coach. And I was also the assistant women's basketball coach at the University of Michigan in Dearborn. So that was an NAIA school and I was doing both of those. And I did that for one season. And the following year, I received my very first athletic director job. So at the age of 23, I was an AD at a charter school and I was teaching and coaching and had the opportunity to be the boys and the girls basketball coach at that time. And um, I did that for several years, uh, somewhere around my second or third year of being the AD. I started my own sports business, Power Zone Sports, and I began doing trainings and camps. We had tournaments and leagues, and it evolved from basketball to many other sports. And fast forward after that, um, I found myself leaving that school, entering a public school later and being an AD there, um, still coaching and building my business all, all along. 
And finally, it was about 2015 when I was coaching varsity basketball and I was in St. Clair Shores, Michigan, and I led my team to a undefeated season and we won our conference title. And at that time, I also received uh, accolades and awards for coach of the year in our conference as well as the entire county and that's when I decided I wanted to go back to coaching college so for the last five years I've been coaching at the various levels in college in junior college as well as the NAIA levels and I'm currently a free agent <laughs> so I'm not affiliated with any college or university at the moment and while I'm actively seeking the next opportunity and I'm searching for the right fit um, I'm putting my skills and my gifts to good use I'm still mentoring and helping students get connected with colleges and I'm also doing consulting and um, I'm have lots of opportunities to learn from workshops such as this and now being a presenter. So that's a little bit about my background. And now that you know a little bit about my experience, you know, I'm gonna I'm dive right in. Uh, my topic mm -hmm. is next level. And again, uh, for those that are just joining in, um, what I'm talking about tonight is not anything that's going to be like mind blowing. It may not be anything that you, you know, heard, haven't heard before, but it's going to be a reminder and a refresher. And I hope that maybe I can present it in a new way where it may get you to think about it a little bit differently. So, um, you know, I want to also mention that I'm going to leave my information, my contact information, so that, um, you know, we can follow each other on social media, Twitter, Instagram, all of that. And um, if there's questions that you have that we can't get to right now, tonight, you know, I'd love to chat with you further um, and just help out in any way I can, especially for some of the younger and the new coaches. All right. So, um, it's so many topics that you can discuss when you're talking about next level. It's so many things where you can be talking about nutrition and conditioning and different things, but I'm going to try to just highlight a few of the things that I feel like um, don't get talked about enough. And being that I've coached um, just about every level, I've coached from elementary to college, um, I kind of know from each viewpoint, you know, certain things that um, is important for you to go on to that next level. So that's why I kind of chose the, 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 the topics that I chose. Um, what I want to talk about first is kind of like the mindset of um, what it takes to be that next level player and that elite player. And as a coach, how do you help prepare that athlete to, to get to that level? Um, let's talk about their basketball IQ and their understanding of the game. Let's talk about you know, how they're intellectually thinking about the game. And um, I wanna talk to you a little bit, I'm gonna use this phrase quite a bit during this series. Uh, let's talk to them about how to play. And what I mean by that is, as a new coach, maybe you enter into, this is your first season with this team, you just got the job, or you're a JUCO coach, and you just graduated all of your sophomores, and so now you're bringing in a whole new batch of freshmen, we tend to kind of get into that space of, oh, wow, we got we to gotta get the offense going. They got to know my system. We got to learn this play. So we're focused more on teaching a play and we're not concentrating enough on how to play. And so what I want to talk about tonight is, again, just some of those reminders and some of those things that we need to kind of go back to and make sure that we're laying a good, solid foundation to build on. Because we all know what happens when we have a, a bad foundation and there's, there's cracks, okay? Stuff starts sinking through and, and stuff starts falling and collapsing. So we want to have a good, solid foundation. And I think that's uh, some of the things that we want to touch on. All right, so, and going forward, um, I think that one of the things that we want to talk a little bit about when we talk in terms of building their, their IQ, um, we talk about this specifically in the girls game, 
there's not enough young ladies um, in, you know, middle school and elementary and even in high school, they're not playing enough pickup ball. And I think because they're lacking that area with not playing enough pickup ball, they're not really uh, understanding the game like some of some of the guys do because they haven't had that playing experience. So we need to start thinking about, you know, how to incorporate more live action in practices. And I'm not talking about being one of those coaches where you just roll out the balls and let them scrimmage all day. But when you are going live, when you are doing your scrimmages, we need to be doing more teaching and scrimmages and being able to stop and blow that whistle and talk about things and get them thinking. Again, we don't want them to, to have this robotic type of style where it's just, oh, you know, this is the play. So I pass to this wing, I go here, I cut here. But what if that's not open? That's causing turnovers and we're creating kind of a, you know, a mess with that because they're, they're being so robotic. So we want to talk to them about how to play versus, you know, not just running the play, but we want to know how to play. Um, so I'll touch on that in a little bit, um, a little bit more, but, you know, as we go along, I want to talk about footwork, um, footwork skills are essential. They're, they're critical. And we see it at the JUCO level where we've got students who are, you know, doing that little shuffle thing before they take off and go to the basket and is resulting in a travel call. We've got, um, you know, poor pivoting and we're dragging our feet and those types of things. So that stuff, when we see it, when we're going live or we see it when we're scrimmaging and practices, um, that's something that we've got to address and we've got to over and over go over that with our players instead of letting it slide because they're not correcting it. We've got to make those opportunities to correct those things instead of just on the sidelines during the games, you know, that that inner beast wants to come out. Hey, what are you doing? You're traveling again. We can't just go there with them during the games. We've got to be correcting that all along in practices. So um, again, that's a how to play type of thing. Um, along with the footwork, talking about um, the pivot, I had so many conversations in these last few you know months especially when we've been doing all these web calls and zooms and things like that and you know I'm talking to different coaches I had an opportunity to speak with a division three juco coach and she was saying how she had to teach her kids triple threat they didn't know what triple threat was like they couldn't name the three things in triple threat and me I'm just like is that for, is she playing? What is it? She's serious. And then I thought about it. I said, well, Danielle, you know, you've had some teams like that in the past too. So again, as a high school coach and as a middle school coach and as a junior college coach, we've got to do more of these fundamental things. We've got to do this and lay out a better foundation. There's no way a college athlete should not be able to name the three things in triple threat. <laughs> okay. Um, there's no way um, we shouldn't understand uh, and be confused about how to do a forward pivot and a reverse pivot. So that's some of the footwork. When we're talking about doing a jump stop, um, are we helping them and talking to them about being balanced on that jump stop? What's the point of doing that jump stop? Okay, you want to get planted, shoulder width apart, you, you want to have balance. Um, you know, I find that a lot of things, um, this is another, you know, little part on the side, but when our athletes don't know how to land properly, that leads to injuries. And that's another subject about doing injury prevention and, and things like that, which are strength training and conditioning. But you know, knowing how to land, that's helping to protect that athlete. And you know, that's helping them as well. Um, so the jump stop, that's one of the things to me, I feel like that's an uh, underutilized skill because we don't talk enough about doing a jump stop, two-footed power layup. Um, a lot of the times uh, kids, and I find that they're kind of forcing the situation, they're trying to force a one-footed layup when they could be making that move, you know, you're going full court, 
full speed, you got somebody chasing you down, if you just come to a jump stop and put on the brakes, that defender that was chasing you, they're going full speed, they're going to zoom right by you, you came to a full jump stop, now you got a power layup, and they're nowhere around you because they went flying by you. So again, that's another one of those how to play type of things. Um, just learning those skills. Um, screening and setting screens. And uh, coaches, I know you can relate when I say this, but there's some really, really bad screens. <laughs> we, we, we mess up a lot on the pick and rolls. And that's some of the stuff, you know, I go back to when I was in middle school, that's one of the first things we talked about is pick and roll to get to the basket. But why fast forward all of these years later, why are we still struggling with the pick and roll? Why, why are we not setting good screens? Well, I'll give you two reasons because there's many, but I'll talk about two. One of them is that we don't want to get physical. And, you know, I see a lot of the guys, you know, we're, you're, we're getting physical, but they're still not using their bodies in the right way and putting themselves in a position. And with the girls, some of them don't want to be physical at all, and they just totally dive back and, you know, don't want to use their bodies. Um, you have to touch. You, you can't, you know, thrust and throw your arms into the pick. You want to be stationary. And again, shoulder width apart, you know, ladies protect yourself gentlemen protect yourself but you got to set that screen and you got to touch you got to make them run into a brick wall <laughs> okay so that's one of the things the other thing that is an issue with the screen and roll is we are not waiting for the screen we're not it's it's a bad timing and we're not setting up the screen properly so you can't do these two things and I call this one it's an air screen an air screen is when you just run up and you setting the screen on air there's nobody there you're not touching anybody but you're setting an air screen so we can't do air screens and we can't swap spots <laughs> you've got to actually set the pick so those are a couple of the things that I feel like especially at the high school level we've got to set that foundation and we've got to talk about being physical and setting up that screen and making good contact okay um let's see facing up and flashing to the ball so you have a play you've got the low post that flashes to the high post or you're running off of a pick and now you're flashing up to the wing but either way when you flash are we facing up have we done a good enough job teaching our athletes to be confident with the ball so that when they do face up they're not thinking, oh, I'm about to get ripped. I'm, I'm going to get stripped. Somebody's going to take the ball from me. Because I see that a lot of times where, you know, you've got that cutter, and especially when I'm talking about um, low post to high post, when they're at that free throw line and they flash, they don't even want to turn all the way around and face the basket. They catch the ball and then they just, boom, throw it to the wing without turning all the way around. And if we would go back to some of that basic stuff, talking about how to protect the ball, using your elbows and getting strong, not throwing the elbows. I'm not telling you anything dirty, nothing, you know, but being strong and confident with the ball and knowing how to pivot and use your body to shield off the defense. So some of those things are um, essential. And when you're, when we're talking about next level, you know, again, everything that I'm saying, it's a reminder, it's a refresher. This is nothing new, but when we don't lay that foundation and when we don't do these basic things and these kids don't have that in them, it takes away from that time in the JUCO level where we could be laying the next layer in the foundation or that four year school, we have to go all the way back and then bring you up to speed. So we need a better foundation in those younger years so that we can get them to that next level. It's important to have that foundation because kids want to do the accelerated and advanced drills, but until you have mastered the basics, 
there can't be any ex accelerated advanced drills if you are still traveling and shuffling your feet and you're dragging your feet when you pivot or you're not facing up to the basket properly and you are just giving the ball away. Um, you know, I tell my, my post players, I say, you know, we don't give the other team presence. And what I mean by that is when you're holding the ball out like this, that's Merry Christmas, happy birthday. It's a present because, you know, she's surely gonna take it from you, okay? But when you get strong with this ball and you're protecting it, you're not giving away a present. Um, and, and, and going with that, you know, talking about these post players, you know, they do need to know how to chin the ball properly. They need to know how to sit and seal. And that's something that, you know, we shouldn't be introducing that to them when they're in the JUCO level or when they're in a four-year school. That should have been introduced earlier on. We're just helping to perfect it. But that's not something that they should have, you know, uh, that's the first time they're hearing sit and seal. Um, and just along that, uh, you know, some of these skills, I feel like, they need to be worked on so much at that high school level to where when they come to college, you know, they've mastered those basics and it becomes almost instinctive to them. And, you know, they, they don't have to think about it as much. That's what helps, you know, a kid be more next level when they're had, when they have that confidence and they've been working on those skills and now they're at that point where they really are ready to excel and go, go to that next level. Um, you know, I know there's, uh, you know, we, for time's sake, you know, there's more presenters. Um, so I don't want to go too much longer. And if anybody has a question, but there's two more things that I want to touch on. And, and then, um, you know, I'm done. Um, uh, I have to talk about this because this is one of my pet peeves. And this is what I call the security dribble, okay? This is one of the most annoying things and coaches, I think you know what I'm talking about. We take that one or two dribbles and go absolutely nowhere. It accomplishes absolutely nothing. And you just dribbling just because you're dribbling. And in, in doing so, now you have allowed the defense time to react and recover, and you, you, you've done nothing. You didn't set yourself up to be able to get in a position to score. You didn't get closer to a team to be able to pass them the ball. You just started dribbling. It's a security dribble because it just, it makes you feel safe. It makes you feel secure. So that's one of my pet peeves. And I get on my kids about that. But going back to what I said in the beginning, if we are teaching them the footwork, if we are teaching them jump stop, be shoulder width apart, be balanced, have your elbows up, chin the ball and protect the ball. We're teaching them triple threat and rip through and all of these things. We can eliminate the security dribble because they're confident and they won't feel like, oh, well, I, I, I was off balance and I thought I was going to travel. So I needed that dribble. Well, no, you don't need it. We got to get some of these other things ironed out so that we can uh, eliminate the security dribble. Um, the dribble is valuable. And we need to instill that into them. We need to treat the dribble like it's money, okay? You wouldn't waste your money. So why are you wasting that dribble, okay? And then the last thing is just about passing. Because, um, you know, I love a good pass too. Um, you know, I'm one of the older veteran coaches, okay? So, you know, some of the young coaches, you don't really know about it. You, you watching Last Dance and you seeing all this stuff now, but I actually lived it, okay? So I know about the Magic Johnson, no look pass, now you see it, now you don't, and the, the Laker fast break. Okay, my last name is Johnson, all right? So I used to do all of that too, but if you're throwing the pass or you're zipping the pass 50 miles per hour at your teammate and it goes out of bounds, it's a turnover. A good pass is a, a, is a pass that can be caught. Um, we got to do more of that, like even in the drills. When we have shooting drills and we've got the rebounders and they're passing to the shooters, it's important to stress to those kids right then make a good pass to your shooter. 
Why? Because it's going to translate over to the games. If you just allow in drills or in scrimmages when you're doing live and they just fling the ball and throw it any old kind of way to their teammate and we're not working on making good fundamental passes, that's where, you know, that foundation is, we, we got cracks in the foundation, okay? We, we, need, we need to fill those cracks. We got to fix that, all right? We need to talk to our kids and let them know that that pass that you're making to your teammate, that shooter that's ready to go on the wing, you're setting them up. You're contributing to whether do we get the shot off or do we, um, you know, or do we not get the shot because it was such a bad pass? So if your shooter gets this great pass and they're able to catch in pocket and they're in rhythm and able to get a good shot, you just contributed to, to good basketball and to helping them get a great shot and for us to score. If you throw the ball at their ankles and now they got to reach down and they got to get back in position and here comes the six foot girl or the six foot guy and now they can't even get the shot off. We just, we, we just blew that opportunity. So we've got to talk to them about that. So again, um, I'm gonna say this cause I say this all the time to my kids. <clears throat> pass is one that is caught and a great pass is one that is caught and converts to a basket. So, um, you know, at this time, if anybody's got some questions, if they want to ask me anything, I don't know if everybody's on yet, if we're ready for the next presenter, but um, that, that's what I've got. And, you know, I can answer a couple of questions. If anybody has a question, you if, let me know. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. All right. Well, well, Coach, I really thank you for presenting and being a willing vessel to present to us today. That was some great information that we needed to learn as far as teaching our players coming from high school some essentials that can help them be successful at the next level. Um, that's good, valuable information for high school coaches to make sure that they're prepared for the college coaches that are recruiting them. So my next presenter is on. He's, he's, um, he's actually one of my – good friends and he's at my alma mater as you can see the f's are in the background it's cal state fullerton coach Diedrich taylor is going to come on he's going to talk a little bit about game planning and um coach i thank you for uh being on and one of his highlights is he was the man that recruited james harden to arizona state so coach taylor is all on you <clears throat> thanks for having me appreciate you uh appreciate you allowing me to come in and, and spend some time with this group I don't think we get to X and O it as, as much as we'd like to, whether you're in high school or, or college or, or in the pros, just this opportunity I think is extremely unique and taking advantage of the time that we have now, which is, which is unusual. We don't always have a lot of time. So I'm going to jump right into it. And I, I, I was trying to get on a little earlier to understand the format, but for me, I'm just going to talk about <clears throat> some specific things in, in, in terms of game planning for us. Um, what we do, how we kind of go about it. Um, feel free to jump in with any questions or anything you want me to talk further about, um, but I'll try to keep it as, as basic as possible, but give you a little bit of an insight as to how we do things here. Um, I had the pleasure for working for Herb Sendak, who is now at Santa Clara as the head coach. He was at NC State uh, for a long time. He was at the University of Miami of Ohio as the youngest head coach at 32 years old. He comes from Rick Pitino. And I share all of those things to tell you that um, preparation is something that we is we take very very seriously. Um, it's 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 like for us, it's recruiting, scheduling, and preparation. And I like to be organized um, at all costs, uh, just just so that we all have a plan and we know exactly what to expect. So if we need to make a left turn, then we all know we need to make a left turn and how we're going to do it. So. Um, I'll just jump right into it. Like I said, if we can, if we're playing as much as we can, we try to start our preparation for an opponent or our game planning for an opponent two days out. So if we play on a Thursday, we're going to try to start on at least no later than Tuesday. Sometimes if, if Monday works, just depending on our group and where we are in the season, if we can do some things on Monday, then we will. But we'll spend an inordinate amount of time on Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, talking about our opponent, but more importantly, talking about us versus our opponent. So um, you know, not just, hey, this is what they do. This is how they're going to do it. This, 
but more so this is what they do, but this is what we're going to do from an offensive standpoint, from a defensive standpoint, um, because I think a lot of times a lot of guys or a lot of coaches in general, they, they spend a lot of time talking about the other team. And they missed the opportunity to talk more specifically about who was most important is your team. And a lot of times you miss that and you look back and you say, dang, we gave that game away because we didn't do what we were supposed to. And a lot of times you didn't spend a lot of time on doing that. So we try to try to make sure we pay homage to that and, and start with uh, personnel clips. So for our game plan for us, personnel, 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 it's 1A and 1B for us. Um, I like to try to see if we can talk about the top six, seven, or eight guys. I don't necessarily like to go past that. Um, but what we'll do is we'll take five or six, maybe seven clips um, to organize how that just tendencies of that particular player. Uh, one common thing that I always get on our staff about is, is, you know, you say he's a strong driver, right? And the first three clips is he's driving left and he's scoring, you know, so just just being cognizant of those types of things to, to be able to give your, your team real information that they can see and then they can correlate to uh, being able to, you know, pull that, retain that information and pull it back off the, on the while they're on the floor. Um, <clears throat> so we start with, with, with a lot of uh, personnel clips. Like I said, we more times than not, we'll start with showing, you know, their top three guys or top four guys, and then we'll move on down the line. And I used to kind of, do it to a way, I think Rick Majerus used to do this, where he would make, so if, if you were guarding Jamal Brown, there were four, three or four guys that had that matchup and they had to physically write the description and the tendencies and then how they were gonna, gonna guard that guy. I used to do that. We've kind of gotten away from that because we switch and then obviously there are switches. So I think everybody needs to have some idea as to who's on the floor and what they do best and, and not saying they have to know everything, but at least one or two of their, their moves that or, or one or two of their tendencies. Um, and, and so we talk about that a great deal. Um, <clears throat> the other piece is, is we'll break each player down into two categories. Are they a Rondo or are they a clay Rondo being he's a driver penetrator a uh, clay is a guy who's, you know, not you just, you got to be in his face when he shoots. And so those are the two categories. And I think for us significantly, the most important are we guarding him as a shooter or we guarding him as a driver. Um, and then trying to establish um, a couple of things from there is something that's, that's important to us. But I think being able to establish whether or not they're a Rondo or a clay is, is, is important for us. And then I'll, I'm going to go back just a little bit in terms of as we're talking and game planning, we try to keep our terminology the same so that each coach is not saying that, you know, using different terminology for the same concept. We try to make sure that we're on the same page so that our guys are hearing the same message. Even though each coach has his own style and his own uh, delivery method, we try to ask that they use the same terminology so that our guys can stay organized and stay on the same page uh, from that standpoint. And then from there, we're going to talk about team tendencies from an offensive standpoint what they do. Are they a big transition team? Um, do, what, what do they do in transition? Are they just kind of a jailbreak where they just space the floor and they go, or do they have like a secondary break or some things that we need to be aware of? Um, and, and we will determine, okay, do we need to get two guys back? Do we need to get three guys back? Do we need to get four guys back? Just from a transition standpoint, um, the way we break things down defensively. Um, and then once we get past the transition piece of talking about what they do offensively, how they do it. We also talk about what we need to do. You know, one of our terminology is cupping the basketball. So our transition defense is getting the ball out of the middle of the floor and then building a wall around the ball, but cupping it as well so that the ball can't see space. Um, and, and again, that's just a terminology thing that we like to stay connected to as we're, we're coaching and teaching our guys. Um, the other piece is just getting into the half court. What are four or five actions that they run? Um, and then, and, and so the second, the first day that we're on the floor, we'll kind of guard those actions live or we'll break them down in kind of a shell type of format so that our guys are familiar with them. So now they have the personnel, they have the actions on the first day. And then when we start the second day, we'll start with those actions so that they can see them on the floor and see what they look like in real time, what their pace is. Um, another piece that I'll throw in is we talk a great deal about um, <clears throat> special edits. So team tendencies, what they do, like if they really, really press and, and get after you, there's, it's, it's kind of hard to mimic their pace or what they do pressing wise. So we'll 
show it on film in hopes that our guys can kind of grasp the concepts of just giving them an idea of what some of their team tendencies are and how they do those things. And then, you know, like I said, we'll talk about four or five actions in the half court, things that we need to rep, things that are unique to the way we guard or their bread and butter, so to speak. In fact, that's one of the things on our scouting report is what is their bread and butter? What do they come to when they need a basket? So we'll talk about that and, and talk about how we're going to guard it and make sure we're all on the same page with, with what we're going to do. Um, then the other piece of that, a big part of ours is, is what is our ball screen coverage? You know, what, what are we doing on drags? What are we doing on side pick and roll? What are we doing in the middle of the floor? Are we, and we again, we go back to our terminology. Are we blacking it, red or white? And that all is correspondence to, to different ways that we'll guard it. But I think at our level, ball screens are super duper prominent. So I always want to make sure we are on the same page and understand going into the game, we're guarding it this way. And if we need to adjust, then we can adjust, but this is how we're going to guard it um, across, the, across the board. And then we obviously, <clears throat> for us, we try to emphasize rebounding. We weren't very good at it this year, but that's a point of emphasis as far as rebounding. And something else that, I've, that the new staff has brought that I like, that I think is unique, is, is just how we rep uh, the action or how we talk about their personnel. So one thing that we'll do is, is we'll have three different baskets and each, you know, three different groups, obviously, and a coach will have, he might have two different players or, or it might be one player per basket and those, those are their go-to guys. And so they may be coming off of a down screen or they may be getting into a, a ball screen a certain type of way. And so we mimic that so that they can get a feel for what it feels like, what that sensation is like, you know, carrying a hand or just some specific things, but just kind of more in a isolated format so that they can, they can hopefully understand it, they can see it but then also feel, get a feel for what that, what that's like or what that sensation is going to look like uh, throughout the course of the game. And so we'll also do that for actions as well. We'll break down the actions and kind of put them in a, like if they like to run a, a two man game, which is a DHO action for us terminology wise, we'll break that down and put it out of basket and the coach will be instructing of how we want to guard that particular action. I'm going to pause really, really quick and see, if there's any questions or anything you want me to go further into or, or anything of that nature. Um, I have a question. Uh, my name is Brianna Workman. Um, about what you said about building the wall and then you said cut the ball. Um, what does that mean to you guys? So building a wall is if you imagine, I'll use if the ball's in the middle of the floor, um, what we're going to do is the guy who's on the ball, he's going to obviously be in the middle of the floor, but we play gap principles. So if there's two other wings on the floor, just imagine it's a three on three setting and we'll put those guys in the gap. And so that will kind of mimic a wall. Um, if we're going to cup it, what we'll do is most teams, they trail with their four man. And so we'll take our four man and literally just kind of put the ball in a cup and not let it really go anywhere. And, and so from a visual standpoint, cupping is just kind of, you know, really controlling and containing the ball. And normally that's because they have a dynamic point guard or they have a dynamic rebounding wing that likes to get it and he likes to get downhill and get to the front of the rim. And so again, the cupping piece is just our way of trying to protect the paint. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you for that. Sure, Any, anything else? I got the one. How important is it that you get back, your guys get back in transition and build that wall? How um, for, me, it's, it, for me, it's the primary focus of our defense. If we can eliminate teams scoring in transition and get them in the half court, making it a five on five game, I think that gives us a better chance to, to, to deal with their offensive efficiency. Um, if we can eliminate or curtail as many transition points as possible, again, I think it gives us a better chance to, to guard them and put, you know, 10 toes in front of the ball and, and really, really guard the ball and, and hopefully um, eliminate any transition baskets. Now, offensively, on the other side of that, that's the best time for us to score. I really want to try to score in the first six seconds of every shot clock because I think teams are in disarray, so to speak. They're trying to scramble back and there may be a cross match or a mismatch. And so if we can take advantage of that and get downhill and get to the front of the rim to either score it or pitch it out and drive a long closeout, that's something that we we spend a lot of time trying to do and, and, and trying to put pressure on the defense that way. So you know, if you're talking to me, you're just like talking to two different people. One side of the ball, I'm, I'm, you know, complete opposite of I am on the other side of the ball. So it just kind of 
goes that way. So I always tell our team, like, if you're on offense and you scored, good for you. If you're on defense and you got scored on, shame on you. So I'm, I'm mad at everybody all the time. Just, it just, that's just how it works. Um, <clears throat> so nobody's, nobody's comfortable. Um, anything else question wise? Uh, okay, cool. I will get back into um, this. Oh shoot. Yeah. Uh, I'll get back into this deal in terms of, um, you know, team. So, so that's kind of what we do team tendencies from an offensive standpoint is we try to break it down transition half court. And then once you in, in the half court, our ball screen coverage is dealing with different, different screening actions and things of that nature. But then we obviously overemphasize rebounding. Just if you make a mistake defensively, you always have a chance to clean up for that mistake by rebounding the basketball. Don't, don't give them a second chance. To, to get the get a score. And then and then something that we do also is is and I kind of stole this from uh, Coach Williams. He's now with the Phoenix Suns. I had a chance to watch them when they were preparing to play Golden State. He was the head coach at uh, New Orleans. Um, they do a lot of stuff offensively as well. And so whatever the team tendencies of our opponent defensively. So if they hard hedge ball screens, we're going to spend a lot of time working on hard hedge, you know, what our reads are versus the hard hedge. Um, if they do anything unique when we throw it into the post, we want to make sure that in our sets, guys can know what to expect so that hopefully it alleviates the pressure of them feeling like they have to go make a play and they can just make the simple read and the simple play. And so we will, we will start our practices in a lot of ways um, during that two-day prep with um, different warmups of, of how we're going to attack that group, um, repping shots, repping different finishes at the rim, the way we want to get downhill. Um, you know, and again, like I said, what is their ball screen coverage? How can we take advantage of that? And so we will already know that before those two days, you know, um, start each, each of our coaches, we have three full-time guys and we do every third. So every third is a new guys scout. Um, for me, I'm, I'm involved in every scout, like knee deep involved. And I try to watch, I feel like if I can, depending on the time, if I can get two and a half, if I can get two full games and then I'll watch a half, a half of, of two different games, then I'll feel okay. But if there's more time, I'll try to watch as much film as possible. And our staff does a pretty good job of telling me, hey, you should watch these two or three games in this order to get a feel for their team. And again, that's just a conversation that we have with our staff. Um, but, but going back to getting on the floor, what is their ball screen coverages? Um, what are our actions? What actions in the half court do we have that will take advantage of the way that they guard? For instance, UC Irvine is a team that is really, really good in our, in our league. In fact, they've won the league. I think the last two, three years, they've won the league. Um, yeah, and then the last two out of three years, we also have been in the conference championship game against them. And so they, they're they at the top of their game. And so what they do from an off defensive standpoint is their four man is a hard hedger. No matter who their four is, he's going to always hard hedge. And so versus that, we're going to try to throw as, try to set as many um, DHOs or ball screens with our four man so we can throw back to him and now he can drive it. With their five, if, they, if you can get them in a ball screen in the middle of the floor, they're just going to drop. And so we just try to make sure that we, you know, we'll set up something at two different ends. Our fives are at one end and they're setting ball screens for our users. And then our fours are at the other end and they're setting ball screens for our users as well. Our fives always roll um, and our fours are, are, they can do both. They can roll or they can pick and pop. It just depends on who they are and, and what they do. And they have a way to communicate what they're doing. Um, but again, I, I think it's important to give your guys some confidence and let you know what you expect from them. You know, th these are our principles. These are our, this is our system. We're highlighting these specific characteristics for this specific team. Uh, moving forward, it might be different, but that's just a part of the game plan. And then obviously you can change those things up um, as far as the game goes, as if you're, you're, you're playing and it's not working, obviously you gotta, you gotta change it up based on that. And I'll share this with you. Um, I was on a call yesterday yesterday with, with seven different uh, NBA assistant coaches, and they were talking about their particular role during games. And a lot of them mentioned game planning, like what they actually do. And some of them chart certain things. And one thing that I thought um, was unique and something that we're gonna chart is just 
you know, how a team, what action is a team scoring on us with? What are they doing? How are they doing it? And then what do we need to do during our timeouts to, to adjust to that? Um, you know, another one was talking specifically, they only watch the offensive side of the ball. They only watch what are we doing? Is it working? Do we need to change it up? And then that's a conversation between him and the, him and the coach. Uh, some of them have freedom to automatically just change it up no matter what the coach, you know, it's a conversation between them and the coach and how their relationship works. But um, the game planning piece came up a lot amongst the assist, assistant coaches. So I thought it was really unique to listen to those guys talk coming into my conversation with you guys today. And, and, and at that level, a lot of it is the same. They will have prepared a script almost of you know what to expect in certain situations um and i might be getting off tangent here but one of the things was one of the questions was is it's five seconds on the shot uh, five seconds and left in the game um it's your ball you're down three or let's let's do the other one it's your it's the opponent's ball you're up three and so they asked like two different coaches and the first thing they asked was is are they a fouling team do we have a foul to give and I just kind of thought that was really, really unique that they would, they would, they're already prepared for those situations. And of course, at that level, it's just straight hoop. You don't have to worry about whether, whether Tom is going to class or whether Sally is, is, you know, doing what she's supposed to. So it's a little bit different that way. Um, but <clears throat> the game planning piece, the in-game adjustments, I think are always super duper important. And I like to look at it through film before. So I know, okay, when, after timeouts, they like to run a specific set or they're going to run a set after timeout. So we're prepared during our timeouts to talk about, hey, watch this back screen, down screen action coming. Watch for the lob. And so utilizing film that way, I think helps a lot. Um, the other piece, and I've talked a lot, huh? The other piece is, is um, you know, what are, the, what are the keys for winning? And, and that sounds like an arbitrary question, but we try to break it down into three things. And from the start of the, game planning, the start of the preparation, it's a common, those three things are common themes. If we do these three things, we'll give ourselves a chance. So we started with that. And then even our pregame talk going out on the floor, it's, it's, it, it's included in that piece with our team. Um, and then, and then for, for me personally, my, my script on the board is writing, you know, three concepts offensively that we're focused on. Can we, do we need to get them in a post? post-up situation or ISO situation versus this guy. Um, you know, can we get to our ball screens differently to, to, be, to, to be able to take advantage of what they do or don't do offensively or defensively? And then obviously defensively, what are the three things that we want to make sure we're focused on? Transition, you know, if it's not a transition team, then, you know, getting them in the half court and what to expect in the half court. You've got to make sure that every closeout is on point. Got to make sure individually or personnel wise, we're aware of their best two players. Make sure we're aware of everybody is responsible for guarding those guys, not just the guy who's assigned to them, but everybody's aware, everybody's responsible for that. And then, and then it may be something like, you know, rebounding or something of that nature. And so um, <clears throat> that's, that's kind of a, a game planning breakdown for, for us, I mean, I think it goes way more in detail than that, but just, just from a skeleton standpoint, that's kind of how we approach it. And, and uh, Jamal, I don't know if that was what you were looking for or if that works for the group on the, on the call here. Questions, let's talk. That was good. Uh, any questions, go ahead and ask Coach Taylor about it. Um, I'll start one with a ball screen question. Are you, when you're, when you're breaking down how you're going to play the ball screen, do you do the same action on the ball screen every time, or do you defend them differently based upon who you're playing? Yeah, we try to do, we try to look at how they get into the action. So a lot of teams, they'll use false motion and then get into it. They don't just come down and run a drag. And so we'll try to look at, okay, they got three different ways of those three, they, or they got five different ways that they like they get into it. But of those five, they really rely on three. And so we will, we will, full scale rep that live we'll, we'll, we'll mimic it we'll drill it but how we want to deal with it like we we are a push team so we try to push everything out of the middle of the floor um so so our call is weak you know and and sometimes if it's a shooter we'll have our big guy up so that the guard or the ball just doesn't get to stop and pop i'm, I'm going to change that this year um to be 
you know, you can still stay back, but it's just got to make sure it's a contested two. Don't let them get to the front of the rim and, and, and now all of a sudden they got two on the ball. Um, but yeah, we'll change it and mimic it as much as we can um, to their actions. Coach Thomas, did you have a question? Yes, I had a question. Um, as far as like, can you list the three things that you said are keys to winning? Uh, it, it, it changes every game. Um, you know, it, it just, it really just depends on every game. So like, for instance, we'll play, I'll give you UC Irvine. They normally are tops in the country in offensive rebounding. They average 14 a game, 14 offensive rebounds a game. Um, so that will be a key for us is we have to keep them at 10 or below. And we'll track that throughout the course of the game. You know, at a media timeout, we'll say, hey, they already got nine offensive rebounds. What are we doing? We don't want to win if that's what, if that's what we're giving up. Um, we'll, we'll talk about maybe um, paint touch scores. You know, they've already got seven paint touch scores. Our goal is, is, is 12. You know, we're already at that number. So again, it changes every game. But the thing I, I, I like to do is, is don't leave it on the board in the locker room. Let's bring it onto the floor and let's, let's talk about it. And then there are times where you do meet your goals and you win. You know, there are times where you meet your goals and you lose, but just giving our guys something tangible to attach themselves to that they're not just out there just kind of freelancing and free willy, if you will, trying to trying to get a win. No, we're very specific, but I think also with that specification, there also is some freedom for guys to utilize their individual skill set, their individual talent, where they instinctually may be able to get in the passing lane and make a play here. I don't encourage it. But if that's something that they can do and it's something that they can come up with, cool. If they screw it up and they don't come up with it, bah, come on, sit down, bro. I, I think the tangible is huge. Right. <clears throat> yeah, being tangible is very big. And it's and I mean, I'll, if I don't mind, I'll add to that. I'll be talking later on practice planning. But, uh, you know, the, something my assistant implemented this year that – she was at Hampton last year and they got this. She thinks they stole it from somebody, but we, she does a stop chart. And with that, it stats show that you win 95% of the games. If you hit the number of stops you need and a complete stop is securing a rebound off the initial miss shot. Sure. You know, if you don't, they get an offensive rebound and we still, you know, they don't score. It still doesn't count as a stop. No so question. it's, it's, it's really giving them the intangible. So we found out halfway through the year and we, we went up luck. Fortunately, we're 26 and seven, 25 of our 26 wins. We hit the goal. We only lost once. Yeah. And, and we found at halftime, they're looking at coach Ebony and, and she's on this call and they said, coach, where are we at? You know, they know they need to be near 20 by halftime, you yeah. know, and they yeah. need 40 stops. And that yeah. ended up being one of our keys. And yeah. it all dictates to what you were talking about, Coach, because we do the exact same thing you're talking about. I mean, it's, seriously, it's uh, we do the exact same thing on how you break down, how, how we prep. So adding that to it just yeah. literally brought the tangible to everything we taught them and really held them accountable because kids yeah. want rewards today. So they know if they hit that, they're going to get the reward is the win. Yeah. And so that was good to hear you say that, but just something else to go with what Antoinette was asking, a, a tangible right there. And mm -hmm. it – I've shared that with several coaches and I don't get credit for it. My assistant does, but uh, the other coaches that put implemented it, they said it was awesome. It worked. Yeah. I think, I think we, we actually refer to it as a kill. That's three stops in a row. And our goal is, can we get, it just depends on who we're playing, but normally it's right around eight or 10. And it's so funny, the game within the game, if you're, if, if we're at a timeout and you say, Hey, we got three kills or one kill or two kills in that, that, that segment, you're going to score too. Not only are you going to get stops, but you're going to score as well. And to your point, you know, kids, when they know what the goal is and they can tangibly attach themselves to it mentally, all of a sudden, physically, they, they do something different. I mean, and it's, it's interesting. I don't know if you guys do this, but at, at timeouts, I'll speak to my staff right before I go in to the huddle. And sometimes when we're rolling, you can hear them or even when we're not rolling, you can hear them say, hey, man, we got to get a kill. We need a kill. And so, again, it just tells you that they are aware of what's necessary towards winning and what leads to winning. And then on the flip side of that, um, we also have um, paint touches. We have a goal. Ball touches the paint, 
I mean, just, again, it depends on who we're, who we're playing. We want to get 65 paint touches. And then we also have a chart that tells us what happened in those paint touches. And so, again, tangibly, that, that always is one of our goals. Like getting eight to 10 kills is always a deal. Um, 65 paint touches, that's always a deal. And, and we found that, like, like most people know, when the ball touches the paint, probably going to get a good look. And that good look probably is going to lead to a scoring opportunity. When the ball doesn't touch the paint, some dude or some young lady probably just jacked up some shot and it's probably not going to be a good possession. So again, it's just talking about from a terminology standpoint, you know, paint touches, paint touch scores. And I think it just engages them. The kids have wow. something, you, you sit there and give them that tangible, all of a sudden the focus comes right back. They quit worrying about the yep. shot they just missed, the turnover they just had. You know, they start focusing in all of a sudden. I, at least today's generation and being a dinosaur and doing this for 30 years, I've kind of, you know, it's, it's changed. And that anything that can get that short attention span to snap right back. Yeah. So, uh, honestly, yeah. that may be the biggest take and biggest part of our turnaround this year was just doing that chart alone. Sure. Yeah. No, I think, I think, you know, I get on a lot of these calls and I have an opportunity to, to, to share and listen to a lot of these calls and, and, you know, no matter what you do X and O wise, that stuff's great. It's awesome. Like if you run five out, if you run three around two, if you run four around one, all that stuff's great, but as you all know on this call, if there's no buy-in to any of those concepts and they're not mentally engaged and mentally preparing for the four round one or the three round two or the five out, it, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, you could be the best coach in America and if your group's not bought in, you're not going to win. I got yeah. two questions. Yeah, players. I got two questions. Coach Walsh, Um, because you chimed in on that, how do you – decide how many stops you want for your stop chart. Like coach Taylor said, he goes three, he wants eight to 10 kills. So that's that if eight of them, that's like 24 stops in a row. That's 24 stops, you know? So how do you decide how many stops you want to get? We, we set it at 40. And I mean, and we play a team, one team in our league this year, we're lucky mm -hmm. if they have 50, you know, most teams we're striving for 90 possessions a game. So we're going to up the tempo anyway. Um, you know, 60 70 80 whatever well there's one team in our league uh, they're lucky if they get 60 65 70 possessions and you know and, the, and we'll go through the scout and the players say coach they're so slow down i said guess what 40 stops you're guaranteed to win then aren't you we don't make any excuses we're keeping it at 40 um and actually against that team we had i think 38 stops but we still won by 25 and it's because of the number of possessions so you look it's sort of like rebounding you know, I got a team that gets 10 offense rebounds a game, but if the rebounding percentage, offense rebounding percentage is 35%, then they're killing it because, you know, they're shooting 45, 50% from the field, yet I'm still getting 10 O-boards. So it's more on percentages. It's how you tweak numbers. We set it at 40 regardless. Uh, we keep it there, and we open up the year. We played a team out of uh, Indiana who runs the Westhead. I mean, they're, they're wanting they're – they came into our gym averaging 110 a game. We got our 40 stops and held them to 88. I mean, I say held somebody to 88, you're like a happy camper, you know. Yeah. But it so it's just a numbers game. And, um, you know, and we really emphasize, they'll say, well, coach, we got to stop here. They're not scoring us. And no, they got the old board. You, we know offensive rebounds. It's about the discipline because, like Coach Taylor's talking about, that offense, that shot dictates our offense. We get that rebound after they take one shot, we're gone. We're taking off. We're going to get into our – that's pushing us to our offense because of their miss. We treat a missed shot like a turnover. And if I'm giving you a second opportunity, you're up in your percentage. Yeah. Here's the question from Facebook. Um, is there such thing as over planning? Um, how much flexibility do you build into your plans to account for the fluidity of the game? Um, that's for me. It, either one of you. Anybody. Yeah. You um, yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot of there is such a thing as as over planning. Um, and I think that's a that's that's one of the roles of the coach to be able to know how much his team can sustain before you start creating that overload mindset to where they're not they're not free they're not playing. I try to bunch up three or keep the keep things in threes, um, you know, so that they can hopefully. <laughs> I try to keep them in threes and hope like hell they remember one of them. That's just, that's my group. Like, like that's my group and not just being frank. Um, but, but you will find, I think over the course of time, they will eventually be able to regurgitate 
all three if you keep that format consistent. So our format and the organization, how we go about things is we try to keep that not stringent, but we try to keep that the same. So it looks the same, but yeah, there's plenty of freedom and plenty of, plenty of leeway um, within the confines of how we organize our game plan for freedom. And again, that's the last thing I want to do is, is, is constrict their mind. I want to give them a couple of nuggets here and there, and then trust that their talent, their IQ, and their willingness to win is centered around team ball. And I'm going to let them go play. And to bounce off that, it's what you said at the beginning. It's more about you and how you're going to prepare for them, which I think allows that freedom. And I'm big on the rule of three. Studies have shown as a human race population, you remember three things. Once you get past that, it drops down. The number, numbers drop down. So I'm yeah. big on the rule of three and hoping you're right. They remember one of the damn things. But most of the time they are remembering it all. But the yeah. bottom line is revert back to you and what we talked about and how we attack them. Play your game. And that's John Wood. John yeah. Wooden won all those championships in a row, and he didn't do scouts. They yeah. played their game, and he made people beat him. Yeah. And I think we overthink. I think as coaches, we overthink sometimes. I am I get caught up in it. No doubt. But, you know, I've got a good assistant and others around me that remind me, do yeah. what you do. Don't try to overdo. And yeah. uh, it's – I, but you'd said that from the beginning, take care of you first yeah. and then give them the little nugget, so to say. Yeah. All right. I appreciate it. Coach Taylor. I know you're on the West coast. It's still early for you, but yeah. we appreciate you chiming in with us um, to share that knowledge of game planning. Um, the, we're going to move into the next topic. Awesome. Um, Thank you. I appreciate you. Um, you staying on. Yeah. I'm going to stay here. Okay. Uh, the next topic is by coach Antonio Snell. He's a head girls high school coach at North Haven Bay Charter. I think I said all of that right. I think that's all the right names. You can unmute yourself, coach. Um, he's going to talk about the positive impact on coaches. It's, it, you know, he, he felt that this was one of the topics that needed to be talked about, not for, not for people on this call, but just to realize how much of a positive impact we really have on kids and how much of a negative impact we can have on kids. So I'll turn it over to Coach Snell and you jump right in. Everybody can hear me okay? You're good. Okay. I'm losing you. Come a little closer. I'm losing you now, Coach. Can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, I just I just appreciate Coach Jay uh, for, um, you know, putting this, this clinic together and uh, just listening to um, you guys. And uh, being a young coach, uh, only my second year into uh, high school basketball, and being on the, uh, the girls' side, it's, it's been challenging yet, you know, um, yet fun. And um, I just want to talk about um, the positive impact, uh, you know, coaches have on athletes. And um, I guess I'll be speaking, you know, from, the, from a high school point of view, um, but I'm, I'm sure that, you know, college, the college coaches on here, they have their, um, their view as well, you know, on the positive impact, you know, it takes, you know, to, to get through um, to a student athlete. And the first thing first that I like to talk about is the development of uh, culture and, you know, team spirit. You know, coaches often, they often build, you know, that culture, you know, by, by bringing in a group of kids and first off sharing that, you know, experiences between those players, you know, um, if it's a player, you know, that's, that's um, struggling, you know, with, I guess, being around others, you want, you want to make sure your, your team is gelling and meshing together, uh, you know, before the, the season even start. Um, and you want to make sure that they're all, you know, on one accord and you want to make sure that they're locked in, you know, for the task at hand. And um, great coaches also, they encourage, you know, working together, you know, and, and making it fun and building that success, um, but make, and making, it, making it competitive between the players. You know, if it's a weight room challenge, if it's, you know, running sprints, who, you know, uh, if it's, you know, running, you know, the mile or something like that, um, great coaches find a way to make it competitive yet fun, and that ultimately leads to the success. Um, coaches also... Um, they, 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 they talk it out with their, um, 
with their players, you know, if any any problems come about, but it, in a positive manner. Um, you want to make sure everything um, that that your player is dealing with that they're able to come to you and they're able to uh, trust you, and um, and you also you also want to make sure that they um, let's see, let me going back to my notes. You also make sure you want they want to make sure that they that they keep what you're telling them, and um, you so they can use them as you know skills. Uh, for just life, um, life purposes for their future careers, you know, life um, um, after basketball. So you definitely want to make sure that what you're teaching them and what you're telling them is uh, sticks with them, you know, after the game is after the ball stops bouncing. Um, the second point I want to make is role modeling. Uh, you can't you can't expect your kids to go out there and perform on a high level if you're not carrying yourself, you know, to a high standard. You know, so um, that's that's being on time. That's um, great character. You know, positive attitude. Uh, I I heard uh, Jay Billis say this the other day in my um, on the USA Basketball um, clinic that I was I was looking at. Uh, he was just saying you have to have the ability to be demanding without being demeaning. You got you got you got to be able to demand that respect and demand the performance of the player. But also, you got to lift them up. If they're, if they're doing a drill correctly and they miss a shot, praise them for doing the drill that you want them to do correctly. <laughs> you know, that the, the main shot will come, you know, eventually. But um, we want to make sure that that, they, that they're that they getting the positive um, feedback, you know. And um, that actually leads to my next point. You know, um, the feedback, you know, that, uh, um, that the kids need, it's, it's not it's – not, you know, for the coach's benefit or, you know, the benefit of the team. It's, it's for these kids, you know, they, they need to feel successful. They need to feel, you know, okay, coach coach really believe in me. Coach coach feel like I can run this offense. Coach feel like, you know, that I can – he really believe or she really believe that I can I can run this press the way he need, or she needs me to run it or uh, this play. And uh, the, fourth, the fourth point um, that I like to make is um, – Great coaches know how to increase self-esteem uh, with their, with you know, with their student athletes. Um, a lot of high school, um, a lot of high schools, uh, bas- a lot of high school basketball bring so many positives, but you know it can be so many challenging moments. You know, at times as well. Uh, actually, being here in Panama City, you know, this this year, this last year was probably my. I know uh, I know I've only been coaching for two years, but this second season has been the absolute, uh, probably the worst as far as like just living here in the city. You know, battling a Cat Five hurricane and actually having two tornadoes touch down in the last two weeks, um, and just having the the mental standpoint of the kids. Um, after the hurricane, we had to like jump right into um, a season. You know, we they found a way to. Um, cut the number of games down and um we had we had to make sure our kids really bought into um like coach like coach Walsh and coach Taylor was uh, talk, talking about um a few minutes ago making sure your kids um buy in and with with a with a short practices with um a short amount of time to prepare no off season really to um prepare to what's um what's taking place the, the self esteem of these kids are highly important and um that ultimately, that ultimately leads to um, the kids, you know, with, with a positive uh, reinforcement from the coach. That the performance of the players, you, you'll see, you'll see a big jump. You'll see a big jump in the kids' performance. You know, in the weight room, if you're in there, man, you can, you can, you know, you can lift this. You can, uh, you can squat that. You know, you can bench this right here. When, when those kids feel that reassurance from their coach, assistant coach, you know, trainer, they can get that, um, that extra bill. But if you know on the on the flip side to that, if they're not getting that you know that that positive feedback, it ultimately leads to so the, to uh, low self esteem. Excuse me, and uh, it builds pressure you know on their own to perform better. And um, but most coaches just um, most great coaches really just find a way to motivate you know their players. And the last point I want to make um, is management and communication. <clears throat> you know now being being after uh, done with my second year, 
the biggest thing that I've that I've learned from coaching uh, high school basketball, especially on the girls' side, is learning how to communicate with the players, and not only the players, but you know the over the over involved parents and the um, the under the under involved parents, and learning that balance. And uh, the biggest thing that I took from it. And uh, what helped me get through the season was maintaining positive communication because uh, everybody know that in, in the coaching field, things can get ugly real quick when it comes to um, communication and especially parents with their with you with little Susie and little Johnny, you know, <laughs> if the, uh, the performance, you know, everybody want playing time. Everybody want, you know, want to see their baby on the floor. Uh, far as high school go, I know coaches, you can kick them out the door real quick. <laughs> you can kick them out the door. But um, just trying to keep, you know, the parents, you know, at a, at a level, you know, of uh, sanity and, and, and most of all, you know, yourself. And uh, I think that's the biggest thing that we, uh, that, I, that we deal with on the high school level is maintaining that positive um, communication. And I'm, I'm open for any questions that you guys may have. I didn't have a lot of notes. I just... I just um have five quick points that I that I felt like was um important to you know just touch on, and um I just, I will drop my information uh in the chat, so everybody will have my information. Uh, I'm here in Panama City, like Coach Jay said, um, North Bay Haven Charter Academy, 4A school, uh, and uh, man, I'm just I'm excited to be on here. Anybody have any questions? Oh. I think I'm telling you, you're you're 100 on, and my assistant. I think she's on here. She can tell you, and if she'll speak, I don't know. She'll be too scared. But the we inherited this program, and the coach that had it prior was a great coach. Moved into the AD role, but there was a piece we brought to the table that they told her that they really loved how we cared about them on and off the court. We wanted to be involved in them. So that allowed us to, when we did get on them, because oh. transparent, I tell them up front, I even tell parents when we're recruiting, I'd love to make a million dollars, but it's not going to happen. You know, so oh, yeah. it's just like your child, you want her to play 40 minutes, but it may not happen. So we're transparent with them from day one. And I think if you're transparent from day one and stay that way, stay consistent and show, then put it this way, back in the day, with you know, for me, it was a long time ago, you got chewed out and that was just how it was coach said it done kids still want to be coached hard but they need to know you respect them first and care about them first before you can coach them hard i i firmly believe that that's a big point that's a very big point coach now i appreciate you for sharing um coach woods can i ask you a slight slight favor um i need let me let coach jason williams go because he has a a banquet to get to, and I don't want him to miss the banquet. Is that okay if he goes right before you? Only because I like Jason a lot. Am I going to say yes? <laughs> hey, I uh, you Coach, Coach Brown, uh, she's royalty over here at Belmont Abbey College, but I can tell my athletic director, hey, Coach Woods had to present first, so it's all good. So tell, Coach Miss, I got, tell Miss I said I got to go. No, I was just <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You hung up in the rafters over here, so Coach oh, yeah, Woods always first. I, I, I will. Always, always hear her before. So, Coach Brown, you can give it to Coach Woods. Let her do her thing, please. Okay. No, I'm just joking. You good, Jason. I promise. No, no, you got it. You got it. I know. I know. I want to give you the floor, Coach Woods. I got to deal with Coach Pate. You see what I got to deal with? I see. I see. <laughs> Bunch of right, riffraff well, on I, here, Jay. Bunch of riffraff. Nicole, yeah, I see it. I see it. Well, let me introduce you properly. Uh, this is Coach Nicole Woods. I think she doesn't need an introduction to some people because some people know who she is. Um, Belmont Abbey legend, uh, eight years at UNC Charlotte there. Um, met her about, I don't know, five, six years ago, something like that, and been friends ever since. So, Coach Nicole Woods, go for it. Well, I'm not going to be before you all long. Look, I know we got to get Jason off of here, too. Um, I, I told um, Jay, well, first of all, like like everyone said, thank you for putting this together. Thank you for um, allowing me the opportunity to speak. I can't believe that I'm kind of a veteran coach now. It seems it's just my grandma told me that, you know, time was going to go with or without you, so you better get on board, and that is definitely the truth. Um, and so for me, um, I've been coaching – 
Um, this is just finished my seventh season. So going on my eighth season and nine years overall um, as an assistant coach and being at Charlotte for seven years by choice, you know, you don't get that a lot. You know, uh, there's a, a lot of movement that happens a lot, especially with assistant coaches. And so I do think that there is value in finding somewhere that you enjoy being at and being content being there. Um, not necessarily looking for um, somewhere where the grass is greener. Um, I'm a firm believer that the grass is greener where you water it at. Um, and so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about longevity. And I've kind of got, like Antonio did, I've kind of got five things that kind of goes along with the longevity. Um, the first thing I've got is that you got to be knowledgeable at what you do. Um, you know, you just can't show up and think you're just going to keep your job just because you're a nice person and, and all of that. It doesn't work like that. You know, just like if these players aren't putting the ball in the basket or stopping people from putting the ball in the basket, we're not going to have jobs anyways, right? And so you've got to be knowledgeable at what, uh, at what you do. And for me, uh, uh, I attribute, you know, not just, um, you know, my playing time, but my time at the GA, um, at SIU Carbondale, and my job, uh, my entry-level position at Stetson. At both of those uh, places, I literally had to do everything. As a GA, we had no video coordinator. We had no dobo. Um, I was the camp coordinator. I literally did everything associated with the program except for recruiting, and I assisted with that. And so, um, you know, uh, a lot of the, the uh, my, my counterpart, shall I say, they don't know how to do a lot of stuff, you know, and they're so used to people doing it for them. And so I think you just being knowledgeable and well-versed on, on everything so that if something breaks down or you can't do this or that or other, you, you can be the one that fills in the gaps, you know. The, it, it's something to be said to be that person to where – hey, coach, whatever you need, I can, I can do it. And really to be able to do it. Um, I think that's number one. Number two is knowing what your head coach, what, what your head coach wants. You know, I think as assistants, we get it confused a lot of times to think that it's about us. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, I think my first, probably my first year, um, year or two, um, I remember thinking, all right, I'm just going to go out here and get the best players. You know, well, just because they're the best players don't mean that they were the best players for my boss. And once I really got to, like, understanding what she wanted, you know, what types of players she wants, um, and then how she wants to run practice, how she wants to do this, that, and other. Once I got a, a grasp on that, like, I can finish her, her statements now. You know, like, that's just, that's just the way we are. And just for clarity, my boss and I couldn't be – like we are complete opposite. She is in a complete introvert. I'm complete extrovert. I'm her yin to her yang type thing. So don't think that we're just, you know, we're, we're the same person because we're not. But I've learned to um, know what she wants, give her what she wants. And because of that, we we've, we've continued to grow in our relationship. The third thing is you want to be a fire extinguisher, not a fire starter. You want to be the one that is always the one that is going to be able to bring solutions to the problems. One of the early things that I learned from Coach Lynn Bria at Stetson was, what did I, she would always say, what did I hire you for if you are going to continuously bring me problems? She got enough of them, right? Our job is to be the one that, to, that, that uh, extinguishes those fires. Like, for example, this wasn't necessarily a fire, but I knew for the last three or four years, when it came down to February, January, end of January, February, February, and March, that our players were like dog tired. They were. I mean, they're not like how we used to be. We could all practice three hours and keep playing, and, and that was just what we did because we grew up playing, right? Well, these kids don't grow up playing. You have to understand, they grow up training, and training and playing is completely different. And so we had to find a way to still be fresh 
um, come down the stretch to be able to execute the way that we needed to. And so myself and our strength and conditioning coach got together and came up with the formula. Like, coach, if we stay within an hour to an hour and a half of practice, we win this percentage of the time. These players are this less likely to get injured. We are more likely to be, um, you know, in a better case scenario to win. And I don't care what happens after that. We have to keep it between an hour and an hour and a half. And down even towards February, we got our practices down to about an hour. And we won nine of our last 10 games when that happened. And so being able to not just say, hey, we're going too long. We don't need to practice, you know, three hours. We need to be able to give some solutions to, okay, this is what we can do. This is how this can work. And let's try it out. Here's some data to back it up. Because, like, my boss is a data person. So I can't just say what I think. I got to have something to back up what I think. And so being able to, to like provide solutions is, is key. Um, the next one is personal growth and self-development. Um, I always say that if being who we are could get us what we wanted, we would already have it, number one. And number two, you have to be good enough for people to want to follow. You know, like we, we are, our, our ultimate job is to be example to these student athletes, right? And to show them an uh, example of how things can be done. And so if you aren't growing and you aren't doing this, that, and the other, you have to be able to practice what you preach. And so whether that's reading books, whether that's, you know, doing Zooms like this, whether that is going to watch practices once we're able to, you have to be able to continue to grow. You have to be a sponge. You have to be willing to, um, you know, to say that you don't know everything. The worst coaches are the ones that think they know everything. They are the worst ones. And you don't want to, you don't want to have that, that stigma because then nobody wants to work with you either. If nobody wants to work with you, then nobody's going to be saying your name whenever jobs come, come available. Um, so you want to, you know, you want to be uh, personally grow and you want to develop and you want to develop your life outside of basketball too. You know, that's taboo to think that we can have a life outside of basketball, whether that's a personal life, whether that's a family whether that's having kids, whether that is outside streams of income, because our livelihoods revolve around these 18 to 22 year olds. And if you rely on that solely, then I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to add you to the prayer list, you know? So whatever it is, like, don't be afraid to develop those relationships. Like we need those relationships in life. And then last but certainly not least, I just think you got to have fun. You know, the moment that this thing starts feeling like it's just a job for you, you need to go get a, a real job. Like, because this isn't a real job, y'all. Like, if you really think about it, like, our job is to help shape and mold young people. It doesn't matter what, what level you're at. That's what we do. And that's what we're put here to, to, to be able to generate some productive citizens for this world. And so um, that is our number one fo focus. The basketball and all of that stuff is, gonna, is going to be able to take care of itself. But you've got to be able to have fun and enjoy working with your coworkers, enjoy um, the relationships with your, with your players. Um, and, you know, I think if, if you do those five things, then you're going to be able to be not just in this business for a long time, but if you want to be at a, at a place for a long time, you're not going to get pushed out of the door which none of us wants that. And so those are kind of the, the five points that I had. Um, I definitely wanted to leave some time for some questions if anyone had any. With longevity, how important is it to be loyal in that longevity? Good question. I always say that, um, you know, <laughs> head coaches want us to be loyal to them, but they're not necessarily loyal to us if a job comes available. So I do think that there is a, there is a balance there. Um, it all depends on what you say loyalty is. What is loyalty? You know, is loyalty not talking junk about your coach behind her back because it, or his or her back? Because it will always get back to them, number one. Um, is it, you know, you not entertaining, you know, other job opportunities? I don't necessarily think that's loyal. I think that's smart, you know? I think if you're, if you're looking to be a head coach, for example, and there is something that comes up, that you might be interested in, then you should look at it. You know, loyalty, loyalty is letting your coach know about it, of course, and, and having the person 
uh, follow the proper channels to, to contact you, you know, if you're in college, to contact the head coach to, you know, get permission to speak with you and things of that nature. Absolutely. Um, but I don't think you should be necessarily handcuffed to a program just because that's where you work right now. You know, again, you got to water the grass where you're at, but you also got to, you know, I always say you got to learn from the past. You got to live in the present and you got to create your future, you know? So if you want to create your future, the only way that you can do that is by, if, if there's some opportunity, say, Hey coach, listen, this is where I'm at. Uh, I'm wanting to do this, that, and the other so that they can plan. The worst thing for head coaches is to be blindsided. They don't like that at all. Whether it's from players, whether that's from coaches, they they need to know. They need to know. So the the loyalty thing, the loyalty thing isn't going to be in question as long as they're in the know. And I mean, we need to be in the know, just like athletic directors want to be in the know, and presidents want to be in the know. It's a trickle down effect. But that's right, hey, Nicole. I mean, you you've been amazing everywhere you've been, and I can definitely, from knowing you and seeing things you've done, could be it will be a great head coach one day if that's what you so choose and. A, asked to do but with that being said I think one thing I would add just from being in this for almost 30 years um be a chameleon because times change like right now the COVID we're going to be into there's going to be new things that are going to hit all of us come August September but players change kids are so different now from the 30 years ago when I was coaching them and you know Katie knows this from her years in it and you know just you've got to be a chameleon you know you get new administration You've got to deal with that. you got to know what, you know, that. So I would definitely say don't get too set in your ways. Stand your ground. Stand to your moral code, moral ethical code. But be a chameleon and be able to adapt and change, too. Because trust me, what I'm doing now is totally different when I had to do at Converse. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right, Coach. She had – Coach Walsh, by the way, she has no desire to be a head coach. <laughs> No, I could tell by the look on her face, but I was just saying, just as a head coach, knowing her work ethic and what she does and how she relates, yes, she, could, she can handle it. Because it's true. There are some that can't handle it. That's true. Um, there are some that can't handle it and don't want to handle it. They don't like all the other stuff that comes with it. Hey, hey Nicole, real quick question um, for younger coaches that might be listening. Knowing what you know now, if there was one thing that you wish you knew when you got into the business, what would it be? Hmm. Um, <laughs> hmm, a lot. Uh, let's see. The, the first thing I would say, I, like, like Dean said, I've always worked hard, you know. I've always worked hard. You know, I think that that is kind of a prerequisite, you know. Um, a lot of times people feel like that they should be um, you know, they should be guaranteed something just because they work always and I, I don't agree with that at all. You know, that's just a prerequisite for what you do. Um, I will say to, um, there's a difference between building genuine relationships with people and networking. You know, I think that people get the two confused, you know, and people try to just network with folks to try to help them get a job somewhere. And I think that, you know, especially us that's been in for a while, we could tell when somebody genuinely wants a relationship with us and when somebody's just trying to use us as a stepping stone. And so I think that would be, um, that would be a big one. And then if I had to do like an A and an A and a B, is to find a mentor early. Find a mentor early. Um, I ended up finding, uh, I, I always had some, but I didn't really utilize them the way that I, that I should have. You know, and I ran into some uh, road, you know, road bumps and some stumbling blocks along the way that I probably could have, um, you know, um, alleviated if I had to just reached out and asked for some help um, sooner, sooner than later. So that uh, those that would be my A and my my A and my B. Well, Coach, anybody else got another question for Coach Woods? Well, Nicole, I appreciate you. Um, for coming in and sharing your knowledge um, and giving us some insight about longevity and five things that we think that could be successful as a head coach, number one, but just be successful in general, period, as a coach uh, in the game. Um, with that being said, we'll move to the next. Got my man, 
Coach Jason Williams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna give it. We're gonna give it up for Coach Jason. <laughs> you say for life, baby. <laughs> coach, coach. No problem. <laughs> All you, Coach, and the share screen button should be at the bottom for you. Fantastic. Um. I appreciate you, Coach Brown, uh, and all the speakers thus far, man, have been phenomenal. Uh, to just be able to hear the just the, the knowledge and, and to be able to share the game a little bit. Coach Johnson, learn from you. Obviously, Coach Pate, you've been a mentor for mine since uh, you had this office. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I just appreciate everybody just in general because um, this has been a lot of fun just to kind of learn and kind of go from there. Uh, Offensive sets was kind of what I was in task to be able to talk about here. And for me, <clears throat> we run the UCLA high post offense, the old school, John Wooden, two traditional post players, and, and just to be able to kind of read and play, let the basketball find um, the action that's going to happen. And so for us and for me, uh, it's kind of difficult because you're talking about set plays. We don't really have a whole lot of set plays. We just basically call guard cut and let the ball move where it moves. And, and for us, um, footwork is, is, is extremely important. Like coach Johnson talked about earlier, you know, you want to teach the kids how to play, not necessarily, um, the play. And so that, that they get a chance to be able to read and react and kind of do different things off of different sets in terms of how the offense, the defense, uh, gives you. Um, and so for us, we, you know, we, we, we give them the freedom to be able to just be able to make a play in the offense and however they want to be able to do it, go ahead and knock yourself out. Uh, see what else here I think also on offensive sets it's all about basically getting them to uh, fit your personnel you know we want to be able to play chess excuse me, play chess not checkers uh, we want to be able to put people in position to be able to score efficiently and uh, with the most ease at ease as possible and uh, I got a couple plays here I will share with you everybody can see that yep yep and Fantastic. All right, so we'll back this up. Coach Pate, Coach Walsh, you guys have all played against me, so you've kind of seen this. Hopefully this works. It's not playing on my end. Oh, there yeah, we go. We in there. <clears throat> so for me, uh, all, all of our plays and all of our sets have to look exactly alike. So whether you know, there's four different options here on this on this play. You can hit the wing, you can hit the post, you can hit this post player here or the opposite wing. And they all go into different sets and different reads and plays from there off of just ball movement. So no, you don't have to call anything or go go from there. Um, and for us, this is a read that you'll see consistently when the ball comes to the top, our nice little two-man game right here. And so they got different reads to be able to play off this two-man game. <clears throat> and we rep it in practice daily. I'm talking like it's it's – that my seniors can literally fall asleep to this and, and, and know exactly what we're doing. Side post series, oh, they know exactly what's going to happen. And so for us in this play, you'll be able to see that inside screen happens, right? Because there's different reads off of it. So she can shoot that shot. She can have that guard coming off for a jumper, possibly. Uh, Coach Walsh, I'm glad I'm not playing you anymore. Um, <laughs> and then uh, they can hit that, that wing that set that screen. <clears throat> So now you got a nice little two-man game on the block to be able to play. And this is my lefty post player. So she's finishing what we talk about, play chess, not checkers. She's finishing with her left hand on the left side. So we purposely put her on that left uh, block to be able to make that read and make that play. And then two, we also put the best shooter in that position to be able to make plays uh, with that two-man game. Gets fouled, goes in the line. We do a lot of huddles and touches, and so I would talk to my team about, you know, this is a great huddle, great communication, good dialogue, et cetera. Uh, I got another clip here for you. Ooh, 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 ooh. Sorry. And so there's different ways that you can play this. We can't see the screen anymore. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Share. Boom. There you go different ways that you can play this too as well. So some people want to be able to deny everything. Some people want to be able to take all kinds of actions away. Some people want to go over. So on this action, but with that two man game, right? Some people want to be able to go underneath that two man game, right? And so we teach our kids the proper footwork to be able to come off of that and knock that shot down. 
right? And so she's got options to be able to knock that shot down. She can turn that corner for that drive because you can see the lane's completely open because we vacated the, uh, the left side of the floor. So she has the drive or you have the pick and the roll opportunity from there to be able to play from, to be able to just make a play. And so for us, you know, we teach kids, you know, how to make reads and what reads to be able to make. And so when we rep this side post series consistently, we'll give them every single read that the coach is going to throw at you. Jam that little guard coming off. What do you do if they go and lock and trail? What do you do to be able to play from there? Hey, Jason, and yes, this sir. might be good for others out there. Cause I, I mean, I remember, yeah, we had some battles and uh, you know, it's, dog fights actually every one of them and I think we were about the only team that did this but we would switch stuff up or deny that post so knowing that now what are you doing with your reads on that are you trying me to give everything because I, if I'm not mistaken we were about the only one that ever did that with y'all yeah you're right <laughs> but I mean it's important because that's again one of those things which go into the reads because you know as coaches if somebody's doing their job and doing the scout they're going to get you in a situation that makes you uncomfortable. And I think as coaches, we need to learn how to handle that and teach our kids how to handle it. Yeah, very good question. So if they are taking which one, which one away, Coach? Give me the, the switch that you were talking about. I mean, about. we, you know, like I know we've denied that high post. And then there are times we switched everything when I had the personnel. Yep, yep, and yep. they'd seem like the switching part was the biggest fit it gave you all. Denying the high post, I know you had your other cutting reads and we gave up threes. So we decided to switch everything on it. <laughs> which caused a lot of issues I know in one game for y'all. So, yeah. but the second game, you totally, you were able, you were ready for it. You were better suited for it. So what are some things you're teaching your kids with that To so I'll get into it here. So as that ball hits that side post, right? If they're switching all these screening actions here on the right side of the floor, this post player on the inside has the slip opportunity to the rim. If you can see the, the arrow, right? So if we get into, I'll go a little bit farther right here, right? That guard's coming off that stagger and you want to be able to switch it, this post player has that switch to that rim uh, to then be able to play as well, you know? And, uh, you know, there's different options from it from there. So that's a really good question. So like when we teach reads, we teach both sides of the floor for us in general. You know, when we rep this side of the floor, we'll rep uh, coming off the stagger if they switch, coming off the stagger if they lock and trail. Uh, lock and trail meaning they're, they're basically um, hip to hip. Uh, what we do off of them, they shoot the gap, different reads. So my, my players know exactly what to do, no matter what. And kind of the constant theme we tell our kids every game, you know, if it's not A, it's going to be B. If it's not B, it's going to be C. And so don't panic. Don't force, pre fight pressure with pressure. Just be able to read, play, and I promise you something is going to be open. They can't take everything away. Because, and I say that because in my to-do list is to call you about this offense because my personnel is perfect. I actually have shooters now so yeah. for next year. So my offense is perfect. You know, it's set up perfectly. And I know what some of the teams do that we play. So I'm just going to hear your, you know, I'm going to talk to you more about this individually. But yeah. I just, that was where I was going with it. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. So it's, it's all about the reads and the repetition. And for us, it takes a little bit of time to be able to get to this point to where they're making legitimate reads. You know, they go under, she automatically knows I have the shot opportunity with good feet because we teach the right, right uh, excuse me, the inside pivot off of that one. She then also knows that she has the, the post player diving to that rim. And she also knows that we have like we call pop the stack on the other side of the floor. But my guards know if they go under, that's an automatic bucket all day long. You better shoot that thing 10 times out of 10. Sounds like you benching them if they don't shoot that. You, you'll hear the horn very, very quickly. Very, very quickly. Um, right. <laughs> I got a couple more clips on, on just basically teaching these kids on how to be able to read and make plays. Um, there we go. So here it is again. <clears throat> they hit the wing. They use CLA off. Bob, you got the side post series, bang, right? And so now we got a really good shooter here at the, the pinch post, right? We're coming down, touching that nail. And then now that's just a read, right? Obviously that's a post player that can shoot it. And then this guard's got the opportunity to be able to go and just make a play. We get into our stuff, get lucky, get a good little pass off of it from there. Um, I got one more clip for you.
so last one, you know, when everybody wants to be able to jam that screener consistently, right, and basically take away that guard so she can't come off of it, we just basically go and set a screen, guard the post. That's a really tough action to be able to guard that guard to post action, which we get consistently. And now that post player has a, an open jump shot from the nail, uh, and we get that consistently. Um, and so it's just being able to teach our kids, again, on how to play and how to be able to make reads. And for us, you know, their freshman year, they struggle. They struggle a lot with basically the constant offense and motion and reads that they're going to be able to get. But then secondly, you know, uh, once they actually get it, they get good opportunities to be able to hit open jump shots and be able to play and read from there. So those are the, the couple clips of, of the side post series and offense that we have. And, and you know, I'll, I'm a firm believer, Coach Johnson, like teaching these kids on how to play and how to make reads off of it is going to be very, very, very big for, for us at the, the collegiate level. And, and we get enough repetition to be able to do it consistently. The kids get really, really good about taking things away and then making the read off of it from there. Coach, I got a question for you. So if now if you're if you're a post player like that last little action you showed there and it becomes a guard to a uh, big screen, is that post player, I know she shot the jump shot there, but is she allowed to put the ball on the floor and continue to the basket either to score or to pass it to that other guard who's coming off the double screen on the other side? I'll pull it up for you. Um, <clears throat> yes, but then also no, because at the end of the day, the, the, the paint's pretty congested. So you you have a lot of so on that inside screening action, you've got other people that you're looking for, right? So she's got the option to be able to shoot that shot, right? Or she's got somebody coming off the stagger on the other side of the floor, right? If Coach right. Walsh is playing this bad boy, which he always does, he he always switches this. I got my post player right here on that block that I'm ducking in to then be able to play. And if not, you're hitting that guard on the opposite side uh, for a possible jump shot. And then a two man game on the left side of the floor. And so it's, it's a nice little action because you got different reads and different things to be able to do. And, and you can just literally let the kids play and kind of go from there. Gotcha. Hey, question for Coach Williams. Uh, Coach, I just want to say, um, you know, thank you for, um, you know, in including what I was talking about with the uh, how to play, and I I see how that works out really good with um, what you were doing with that with that switch um, where you got the guard now guarding your post player, and it's um, you know really a good thing when you've got those post players that can knock down that shot right there at the free throw line, and it, it comes in handy when you know they're they're comfortable, you know being able to face up and being able to attack like that versus just, you know, they just want to stick right on that block. Um, I guess one of the questions that I wanted to know for you is um, because I'm not as familiar with all of you coaches that are on the panel. And I just wanted to know like a little bit um, more about like with your uh, coaching background, um, how long have you been with the program and have you only coached in girls basketball? Have you coached on the guy's side? And with that, if you have coached the guys and the girls side, um, how much more um, relevant, I guess, is the, the how to play piece? Uh, do you find like what I was saying earlier in my talk, do you find that because the guys are doing a lot more to pick up ball, you know, are you seeing like a difference? And, you know, whereas the girls, you, you have to spend a little bit more, you know, working that because they're not playing as much pick up ball or where do you see things? That's a good question, Coach. I coached on the men's side first, and, and Coach Miss is the guy that taught me this. Coach Miss uh, worked at the University of Georgia for Jim Herrick. Obviously, Jim Herrick got it from John Wooden. So, like, you know, I, I kind of, like, I'm a John Wooden disciple a little bit from, like, eight people removed, you know, seven different cousin type deal. Um, okay. <laughs> but, but, uh, but for us in general, you know, um, I love coaching the women's game. You know, I, I, I will stick with it 100%. I'm never going back to the men's game just because at the end of the day, like I, I love the teaching aspect of the women's game that we have. And I love being able to pour into these young ladies consistently. And I believe that the young ladies can make better reads. And I don't want to say better or worse. You know, they, they just make really good reads. And when you put them in position to be able to make a read this or that, and you give them like the complete canvas, you know, to be able to play with it, they do a really good job on being able to decipher A, B, C, or D, and then being able to play from there, you know, and, and for us, it's all about personnel, too. It's about if you have the right pieces, 
for the puzzle, then you're going to be um, perfect in it, you know? And so uh, we ran the same offense on the men's side and it was fairly similar. We could come up with clips and you'd see the same inside screen, the double down and all that good action. But on the women's side, I think they're more fluent with it and more willing to be able to give up the basketball to make the next read and make, be able to make the next pass. And so for us, we, I think we were top five in the nation in turn, excuse me, top 10 in the nation in assist turnover ratio. Um, and, and so for us, you know, like I, I, I'll, I stick with it and I've been running it for seven years straight and I'm not going away from it or deviating from it. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, coach. No problem. Well, uh, anybody else got a question for coach Williams? You can drop one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, coach, I appreciate it. I know you got a banquet to get to. I appreciate you taking a few minutes out your time and your busy day to show us a couple of clips. Um, I'll be in touch with you some about that offense, um, as Coach Walsh will be too. Then me and Coach Walsh can kind of bounce it off, and maybe the three of us can get together and bounce it off and make it happen. Because he I said saw it for four years, so I mean I'm familiar <laughs> with it. I scouted the crap out of it. It's just he does a great job. I think the key component, and he'll tell you, sort of like with the Princeton offense, you have to have the pieces for his offense to work. You better have shooters and an inside threat. He has both, and that's what's made them so successful. He's done a great job, and he's done a great job with teaching it to these kids, and they bought into it. Somebody else mentioned buying in earlier. Coach Taylor did, and you got to buy in. But if you don't have shooters, his, and he'll, I'm sure he'll say this, if you don't have shooters and if you don't have that inside presence, it's not going to be as effective. Yeah, yeah, very true, very true. Key, key pieces to it. And then the, the third portion I'd add to that one is the footwork aspect of it. You know, yes. like the, 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 the footwork is very, very key and, and, and an integral part of what we do. And uh, we, we do it every single day, you know, and just giving that repetition and that constant uh, – confidence you know as they get to past their freshman year their sophomore junior and senior year it's like tying their shoes and they can just kind of go through it from head to toe coach i appreciate it i know you like i said i know you gotta get to a banquet i'll be in touch but thank you again for sharing with us um i think everybody can say that they learned something and it found out something different and something some insight about belmont abbey basketball <laughs> If you need anything, please feel free to reach out. My email address is on the website, you know, along with my office number. And, and I'll, I'm gladly, glad to hear more basketball with anybody. So I appreciate everybody, and it's good to see you guys. Thanks, Coach. All right. Have a good day. Me too. Um, next up, um, we have – he was on with me earlier today. Um, we had about a good hour conversation, and it was pretty good. So Coach Dean Walsh is going to share practice planning and he's going to touch a little bit on recruiting about, you know, because we have some high school coaches on here and probably some going to watch. He's going to touch a little bit on recruiting about what college coaches are really looking for and what they're watching for and so to speak. So the dinosaur is up. <laughs> go, ahead. go ahead, Coach Walsh. Yeah, all on you. Had, to, had to do that, huh? Um, <laughs> little background. This is – uh, been in it, took took a year off here and there, so 28 years now. I've been very blessed and fortunate to start as a head coach when I was 23. 28 years, and your hair still looks like that, Dean? Oh, yeah. Oh. And it's, it's all real. There's no I ain't got 28. <laughs> they, they killing me. Hey, four, oh. years, four years of Converse, and I'm still like this. But anyway. I, uh, I mean, yeah. We, we got to talk about that. <laughs> But you know, I, I was fortunate to start when I was 23 as a head coach. Um, and, you know, I've been an assistant on the men's level for three years and then been bit with the women and to go touch, you know, with what coach Danielle was saying, I'm big on the fundamentals. Um, and we'll get into that with the practice planning, but been very fortunate to be at every level. Um, found out from my sports information staff a um, couple when we went to the national tournament this year, I'm now at Union NAI school. Um, and for this is my first year there. Last stop was at Converse, uh, a D2 school. We became competitive. Uh, we won 32 games in four years, which sucks by my standards, but they won 28 in 14 years prior. So there was some change, but nonetheless, you know, it's, it's my SID here told me that I am the only coach on the women's side to have been to take a team to the round of 32 at every level. Um, NAI, junior college, um, the NCAA and that's D2 and D3 at the NCAA level. 
So I just that all that means is I've been around a while and I've had a lot of good players and some good assistants because we none of it is by ourselves. Um, I'm learning constantly. I'm part of a WBCA mentor to mentor program. I've been part of it since the beginning. And I love teaching and helping everybody grow. So with that being said, anybody on here that needs my info, let me know. Coach Jay's got it. I, I will talk basketball 24 seven. Big Ed knows that we have got absolutely, absolutely. He's I made me late. Learn. He's made me late to a lot of appointments. <laughs> I, I love learning and I love tweaking. I'm, I mean, you know, my very, very fortunate. My mentor was uh, we were good friends because we were close by was Pat Summit. And, you know, her comment, is, it's basically was she's just a great thief. Nothing she has original. She's taken it from others and adapted it. And so I, I, I just say I'm a great thief. I like to take things and adapt. Um, but with that being said, you know, we'll touch on practice planning and I know that's what we're going with, but if anybody just has generalized questions, like even on the recruiting part and things, I just want to answer from that standpoint. I'd rather open it up. I'd like working that way better. I hate scripts. Um, but practice planning, you know, I think it's essential and important to organize your plan because how many times have we gone into practice and you made that plan right before you ran into it, into it and all of a sudden at the end of practice, you're talking to your staff, say, man, that sucked. I'm sorry, that's on you. Um, and we've all done it. We've been there for whatever reason. So I got tired of being at that level. So we will talk, and Coach Gilliam trying to give me shit love on here, but she, uh, she and I will talk about what we need to do for that week. What is our big plan for the week? What are our goals for that week? And then we just break it down each day, what we're going to do from there. And, and just because that's my goal doesn't mean that I'm going to push forward to that. We're going to be good at what we want to do, what we need to be good at before we move on. Um, within the practice plan, we will break it up to where we will have offense for X number of time, defense for X number of time, skill development X number of time. And then any special situations, always incorporate special situations every practice because it's going to come up in a game. And so we will break down our practices early in the year with me starting a new program. We were maybe two and a half hours. Um, but after that, you're lucky if it's a two hour practice and then towards middle of season, we're an hour and a half, maybe an hour. It's about being efficient and good at what you do. If you're still trying to teach them things at the end of the year that you were doing at the beginning of the year, you've screwed up. That's on you. There's been a break in teaching point. That bridge didn't, that bridge broke down somewhere and you weren't able to cross it somewhere with them. So, but every practice, we are starting with ball handling five to 10 minutes every practice, nonstop. It's going to happen. Um, we're going to do a angles and entry passing drill because nowadays kids can't pass. It's, it's bad. I mean, it's, they struggle on reads and how to pass. Um, those are givens. Every day we're going to do positional skill development. Coach Ebony will take the post, but she already knows what we want to work on for that day. Um, we'll have our defensive segments. And basically, we're putting in our base stuff early in the year. But as season goes on, it depends on who we're playing. You know, we'll tweak our defense. We'll change our defense. And it's just – we will do a drill. If I say it's 10 minutes, it's going – I am not going to go 15. I'm not going 11. I'm not going 20. It just – I will have a mental note that we have to work on that again. We have to work on that some more. At the same time, if we're killing that drill, we're done. We're stopping. Kind of the reward factor to keep them excited, to let them know. I think subliminally it tells them, man, we're having a great – we're, we're doing this drill right. If we do this drill right and go hard, we can move on. You know, let's face it, all kids are trying to get – you know, practice can be tedious. So I think you got to give a little bit of rewards in there. And if they know they are going hard – in a drill and they know that they do that, they can move on to the next drill, which in turn means they're going to get out of practice. Guess what? I'd rather have an hour and a half practice where they busted their tail and got a lot done than a three hour practice where I'm cussing after it, wondering what the heck did we just do? You know, to me, it's about efficiency. And I've learned that with age because when I first started, no, I was the three hour drill sergeant. It didn't matter. I didn't care how tired you were. You need water. You better hope you're a camel. I mean, it's just, you know, there was just a lot that's, and I've grown over that and learned that it's about efficiency and uh, it's about utilizing your time well. And um, so we, we do that now in the practice planning. I have my assistant heavily involved in it. I will ask her a lot. I will have her run drills. I think that's important as a head coach to, to allow your assistant to be heavily involved. If, 
My goal with my staff, yeah, I would love, I love loyalty. I love to have them around forever. I'm at the small college level. They will die of starvation if they're at this level forever as an assistant coach. So my goal is to give them the tools in every aspect. And that includes budgeting, you name it, showing them how we do POs all the way down to guard play, post play, giving them every tool so I can move them on to the next level. Um, very fortunate, very blessed. And again, this shows I've just been around forever. I've had, I think it is 36 former players and assistants coaching somewhere right now. Um, I've got three seniors to be that are going into the high school ranks. One, you know, wants college. And then I'm sure our coach E is going to be, she is a major up and comer. And yeah, I mean, I'm serious. I've had a lot of assistant coaches and this is nothing she don't know. She is one of the best I've ever had. And it's due to her work ethic and being a sponge wanting to learn. Um, so, you know, it, it's, and some of the other, you know, Kate, Katie knows me and has seen what we've done. Big Ed knows me. There's a lot of y'all on here that do know me and see what we do. Am I demanding? Yeah, I'm going, but I'm going to make it work because guess what? Being a head coach, for those of you that are head coach, it's no picnic at times <laughs> when you're trying to juggle. But, um, you know, the practice planning piece, and I, and I just gave a shell because I want to hear others' opinions or others' questions and to me, that's easier to discuss and, and break down. Because I think, Coach Jay, we did that earlier today where you were kind of asking how that went, and I thought it flowed a lot better. So I'll, I'll, I'll start it off so they can uh, see where, like, where we went earlier. So um, with that, are you preparing your practice for that week? you setting goals, but are you preparing that as for who you're about to play? Or are you mostly focusing on – yourself your team aspect and then apply it to your scout or whatever it may be early in the year it's literally about ourself our system our style our base that foundation it's getting the fundamentals because honestly you know as much as and the high school coaches that are on here understand this you're mad at your middle school coaches for not having those kids ready for you to play well sorry I'm mad at a lot of y'all for not having them ready to play at the college level because they don't understand the minimal fundamentals there are no excuses I don't care if there's Volley, you know, volleyball, both freshman teams, both JV teams, the women's team, boys team, whatever. There's no excuse. If you don't have the fundamentals of passing, footwork, you know, shooting, I don't care what kind of offense you're running. You're not going to score, you know. So that is huge with us. So we just go ahead and put that in there automatically and allow that to run with it from there. As we get into our season, um, it's still about us. It's kind of what Coach Taylor was talking about. We're going to take care of us, but then we're going to tweak what we do based on who we see. You know, I'm not going to cut my nose off to spite my face. Yes, Coach Ed's watched a lot of my teams and knows my style. This year I was more of a – and he's going to probably fall out of his chair. I ran more of a pack line defense this year. What? And, <laughs> and, I mean, and, and we did that because Coach Ebony and I, after – and I was telling Coach Jay this, after our first six games we were three and three. We were scoring 85, giving up 80. We couldn't cover a chair if we were a seat cover. And so we decided we were changing our philosophies, how we were going to do things, what best fit our team that we inherited. We ended up leading the conference in conference play, allowing 57 points a game. Um, they bought in. They understood the shot, the, the that defensive chart we have, the 40-stop chart. There was a lot of things that they bought into, and they saw it kicked up our offense. We still averaged 75 points a game. So, And we went 23-4 and four the rest of the year. So it's a mindset and a philosophy. So and obviously during that time, we changed our practice planning where we pretty much started, had our defensive drills run at the beginning or in, I mean, at the middle or end of practice when they were tired mentally. Because to me, defense is about being mentally fit. If you're not mentally fit, your defense will break down. They will, an offense will find the weakness. So we really, we didn't do much of our defense ever at the beginning of practices. That was set up for our positional work, for our shooting drills, um, we, we mixed up shooting drills beginning and into practice. Again, shoot while you're tired. I think that's key. How many of you, how many of y'all have, think about it, fourth quarter woes. It's, that's a mental, that's the mental piece. Um, so we do a lot of our fundamental work in the first part of portion of practice. Anybody else want to ask a question? I, hey, I want to jump in, Dean. I, again, I know we could talk forever. So I'm going to try to make this a brief one. Uh, first off, you're right. I almost fell off my chair. I've never known you to do anything slow, not even talk. 
<laughs> so, uh, but that, but that shows, like you said, you're always learning. No matter how long you've been in the game, that's a testament to you being willing to learn and and not being stubborn. So, how did that adjust your practice? Because I'm sure all through that I've known you, you've always been an up tempo guy, pressure defense, get in your face. So I'm sure that had to change a lot of your structure. Yes and no. We're still up tempo with practice. You know, they they all have all about it goes with them there's no water breaks they know there is no they can go get their water anytime they want anytime they feel like they need it so we're still going drill to drill to drill which in, in, includes the conditioning um there's still pressure but with the pack line it was more of there was ball pressure was the emphasis with the exaggerated help after that that's where kind of the somewhat of the pack line came in we were we were covering gaps um we started Let's see, our point guard was 5'11". Our two guard was our best athlete, about 5'7". Our three, who ended up being a first-team All-American this year, the first in school history, 3'4". Um, she was 5'10", 5'11". My four-man's 5'11". My five-man's six foot. So we're all the same size. <laughs> so we end up switching everything. And to have my post players say, you want me to guard a point guard? I said, you want to play? So, I mean, there was still that mentality, and it, it really emphasized our positioning. So what we did a lot of practice planning on there was just the positioning. We didn't take away the ball pressure part. You know, we still tried to push. Um, as you know, we, we incorporated a lot of North Carolina and Yukon's transition. I, I kind of mixed them both where the one through four had the ability to run the run and lead the break. Uh -huh. Where as Roy does that first, first dribble is that hard push out and then heads up looking to release it with the pass. Absolutely. And that, and that was our rule with our one through four. If not, they attacked on a slice, and we went into it, and we got we got fast if we could. Um, so the, that part was still there. The pressing part was gone. The up in your face with everybody was gone. But we still trapped everything. We switched everything and mixed all that up and ran more of a matchup zone. With playing in the gaps, um, <clears throat> did that allow you still, like whoever was guarding the ball, were you able to still put pressure on, on the ball while you're in the gap? Because obviously your gap – help is there and it's taking away the driving lanes, but did you encourage the on-ball defender to get yes. up into the ball handler? We encouraged it. Whether it always happened, I don't know. I think Coach Coach Gillian pretty much almost had a couple aneurysms at the young age of 25 um, <laughs> with, with that. Um, but the rule was pressure the ball. My rule is no skips, no threes. That's it. No skips, no threes. So that's your pressure, your activity on the ball. And the rule from there was, don't worry about getting beat. Trust your help. So if our help was there, they picked up. So what we really emphasized working on, which was tough, and they got better as the year went on, was help the help the helper. So in other words, you knew when you got beat, you had to rotate somewhere else to help your helper who just helped you. So it was a scramble mode almost. And uh, when they started picking that up, you know, you still have to be pretty intense with that because how many times do you have your helper, but then that next pass out of there, somebody's wide open because everybody relaxes, gets lazy, falls asleep. So you still had your activity from that standpoint. Um, we just didn't play passing lanes like we normally do because we knew we would get beat if that was the case. So we understood, and you're right, it's a learning. It's, I, I think, and I can't stress it enough to the younger coaches, to the assistant coaches who want to be head coaches. You know, and I mentioned Nicole, you've got to be a chameleon. You've got to be able to change in that today's times. If you are set in your ways, you're going to get left behind. You're going to lose games. Um, it, you know, that's that's kind of the what's going to happen, I believe. So going into the recruiting aspect, some that are watching, mm -hmm. what is one thing when you walk into a gym recruiting, whether they're on your lists or not, um, or whether you're finding that diamond in the rough, what is the one thing that will deter you away from them and scratch them off your list? Um. First of all, I will let the coach know I'm coming, but my big thing is, one, coaches, it's not about you. I appreciate you letting me be there, and, you know, and I'm there because I already know or have an, a thought that one player looks the part, um, and then I want to see where you, the rest of your team's doing. I may be there because you're doing a heck of a job with the fundamentals, and I want to see what you're doing, but it's going to come down to the attitude of the student-athlete. If you're practicing them and they're going hard the whole time, no matter what, they're being leaders, I'm going to fall in love with them. But if they're – let's say you're getting on player B 
and I'm there to see player A and player A does the same thing wrong as player B and you don't get on player A, I'm probably going to be done because she's going to struggle with me at the next level. I think you know, you've got to treat every player the same. Um, and I get it. You don't want to in high school, it's a little bit more of kid gloves because you don't want to lose your best player or mama's the head of the school board and you're about to get fired if you do. I, I get that. But at the same time, when I watch a game, I'm coming to the game because I want to see the little things. I want to see how they interact with you. I want to see how they interact with officials. I want to see how when things aren't going well, if they're sitting on the bench pouting or if they're cheering their teammates on. Because as Big Ed has seen and several a couple others are on here have seen my teams play, we're known for playing hard and playing for each other. We're going to get in you and play hard no matter what. There's, I don't deal with the selfish person. If they, yeah, they can, you can have a player that averages 27 points a game. And someone may say, why aren't you recruiting her? One, I may say attitude. Two, it may not be a position I need. I'm going to fit a need to help my team. And I think too many coaches, that's why we have so many transfers, y'all. They they are recruited because their coach tells them, their parents tell them, their, their friends tell them where to go. Or because it, it, they're not going because it's one, where their heart tells them to go. And two, because it's got to be a fit. It needs to be a fit academically, and it needs to be a fit athletically for them. Don't if you're a post player and you're going to a team that runs a five out. Guess what? You're not playing, and that's why. And I just think I'm going to be that transparent, and I will be real. I have a lot of coaches that'll say, "Hey, Dean, I know you don't need this person, but can you give me an evaluation so I can help my friend out?" And you know what? I've found players because of that say, "What do you mean I don't need her? That's perfect for me." You know, so that's what I'm here for. It's it's not about me. And as I said, several people here know me. No, it's not about me at all. It's about helping these kids. I, my biggest thing I'm happy with, and I could tell every one of you all coaches this, in my 20 years as a head coach, if they finish their eligibility with me, they have graduated on time. I've got 100% graduation rate. And that's my number one priority with these kids and, and helping grow the game and helping grow the young coaches or old coaches. And I, Because in turn, y'all are going to help me grow because you're with the times and, well, it's kind of running by me and my walker. <laughs> Anybody else got a coach question for Coach Walsh about um, recruiting or practice planning in general? Um, can I get off? Can I talk about more more practice planning in depth? Um, coach, you talked about ball handling. Yeah. What are some of the things that you guys are doing ball handling wise? Is it more warm up? Is it more full go? It's, it depends on our day. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll kind of mix it up, but we are, we're, it's, it's pretty intense. And coach Ebony kind of, I let her lead that. Um, she'll incorporate two ball, one ball. We incorporate, you know, the, where you're pushing on them as they're dribbling down the floor, you know, feeling that pressure. Because at the college level, you know, this coach, it's physical. They don't call that stuff. They'll call the hand check, but the, you could sit there and forearm shiver them all day long. So we're working on protecting the ball, doing that, um, alternating ball, um, Literally, we one that we do that I really like that has helped is while they're dribbling, their partners behind them slapping them, smacking them. I mean, I don't care; they can hit them across the head for all I care. You know, they're just they're it's it's teaching them to focus on the dribble. Um, we let them kind of have fun with that, <laughs> but uh, it works, you know, because now they're handling situations a little bit better. Um, but she mixes it up, and every bit of it, her and myself are looking at walking up and down, watching them. If their eyes are down, we keep going. You know, we, we do not allow, we want eye contact with us. I'll walk by or we'll have their partner even stand in front of them holding up fingers and they got to give out the number that's being put up. Thanks. Any other questions for coach Walsh on that part? Well, coach Walsh, I appreciate you giving us practice planning and some recruiting insight. Um, we got one more presenter. I'm I'm going to talk briefly at the end just because I'm going to end it out and thank everybody again. But um, my best friend is on. One of my best friends is on, Big Ed. He's the only guy that I can hide behind because I'm 6'7". <laughs> so, but, uh, no, no, but he, you know, Big Ed played at North Carolina and he played for Dean Walsh. So I wanted him to come on and give you. No, he didn't play for Dean Smith. Not Dean Walsh. Oh, my God. <laughs> hey, that old. Hey, that old. Man. And that old. He's close. <laughs> he was close. He's got a good name, but he played for the great uh -huh. Dean Smith, the late Dean Smith. I'm sorry. Don't, Lord, forgive me. That was a basketball. Um, <laughs> but 
Um, I just wanted him to come on and give some insight about the Carolina break. I know a lot of us somehow try to simulate it and run it, but for him playing in it from, from under Dean Smith, I wanted him to come out and give us the insight and what it was like to play in it and just talk about it a little bit. I'm up. You're up. All right. Uh, like Dean Walsh, I could talk basketball all day and all night. Again, we've probably made each other late <laughs> to a lot of meetings. Uh, I like a lot of what uh, Coach Walt said because it's, it's a lot about drilling, repetition, um, being fundamentally sound. If you're trying to emulate or try to run the Carolina, everybody calls it Carolina, it was secondary to us and it was drilled. It was, you know, in our mindset so we could run it in our sleep. You have to be fundamentally sound uh, in, in teaching it. So, you know, incorporating in your practice plan a lot of uh, fast break drills, a lot of uh, understanding lane assignments, and got my little board here, so anybody <laughs> want to follow along. Uh, the key thing is understanding what it is and then how to teach it. And then after you do that, then there are certain options you can run from it. Let me make sure I can get this in the camera. All right. So as you know, and you have to have these lanes filled, okay? Those are the lanes you have to have filled. Okay, getting the ball out as quickly as possible. Uh, like uh, Coach Wall said, your point guard or whoever. It doesn't ha necessarily have to be your point guard. It doesn't necessarily have to be your wings all the way, always does running. Okay, sometimes your point guard fills the wing if your three man comes back and gets the ball. Okay, all right. So, so everybody can see this. Just draw it on there and then put it up. Put it up there? Okay. Yeah. You got to understand. I'm, I'm new, new school to this technology stuff, so I'm going to try to do it best I can. All right? So this dribble should not ever take place past half court. Okay? This dribble should get about right before the timeline right here, and then it's a pass up. Okay? One, two dribbles max, and you should be looking up the floor for what we call the pitch ahead. The huge key, the number one key to making a good Carolina break work is this rim runner right here, okay? You need a post player that can run. And, don't, and that's the thing, people get it mixed up. I'm a big guy, like uh, Coach Brown said, you know, I, I hired a lot of people. I was a screen setter, so I got in people's way. I wasn't the lightest of guys but I could run. You can always, no matter how big, how heavy, how slim, how tall, how short, this doesn't take a whole lot of skill. Just running hard toward the middle of the floor. You ain't got to be sub 540. All you got to do is be able to run really hard because that puts a lot of pressure on the defense. Okay, if you got somebody big running down the middle of the floor, I guarantee they're commanding some attention. And also, if they're running hard, a lot of times defenses fall asleep. If this is your score, you know, they start leaking out. If he's a shooter, he gets an easy layup. So you have to have a big guy consistently wanting to run from rim to rim. All right? Hold it back. Okay. Hold it back. Yeah, right there. Okay, now everybody can see it. Everybody can see it? Yeah. All right. So, all right. So now, pitch ahead to this guy up here and whoever is the rebounder or the last post player, okay, let's say that's a four-man for right now, they are what we call the trailer. So you got two wings getting out, running their lanes. You have whoever the ball handler is, more than likely a point guard, but not always, pushing the ball, one, two dribbles, getting to just before half court, looking for the pitch ahead, okay? Most time that's there. And if that's not, I got an option for that too. But most of the time, if you've been drilling it right, they'll know how to get it to this person right here, all right? So we're going to fast forward a little bit, get everybody in position up the court, all right? So ball's on the wing. Let's say that's the three-man, has the ball. 
five. Once you run down the middle, then you establish ball side. You get to that block and you become an option. Big, screaming, whether you are open or not. That's the key thing. I used to have to chew out my post players all the time. That's why you're not at the block. Well, coach, the defense had me sealed. I don't care. You demand the ball, scream for it as, as if you are open. Because what? It draws attention. Anybody making a lot of noise, bumping and screaming and throwing their hands up is going to draw attention. Okay? Calling for the ball, showing a target, whether you're open or not. Sometimes you may get it just because you threw a target. It may be a bad pass, and you get the ball, and you may make something happen. But always be willing to run and uh, – Demand the basketball, okay? That is a huge key, all right? Nothing major. I ain't even taught him a post move. All I've taught him is to run down the middle of the floor and get to this block. That is literally the first thing I teach my post players. Before I, before we even go into guard post breakdown, like uh, Coach Walsh talked about, we do this. We do a fast break drill, and my post players learn how to run from rim to rim and then go to the block, wherever the ball side is. That is the very first skill that they learn in any practice that I go to. All right, the point guard is trailing, the foreman is trailing, and then the other, this is a key thing too, let's say this other wing, if it didn't go to your side, don't just stand there. I always tell my guys, run to the baseline and bounce off the baseline and time it so that when you bounce off the baseline, by the time that ball is swung, to the point guard, to the trailer, all right? Now, this is the key thing. As the ball is moved, again, like I told our post player, you are battling every time. So you need a relentless post player. He ain't got to be good. She ain't got to be good. Relentless. <laughs> Going to the block and being willing to just uh, fight and, and scream for the ball, demand the basketball, open or not, in position or not. You're demanding the basketball. You're making the defense believe that you are open, okay? So even when it gets to this, this four-man, you see a lot of this in Carolina. You see that high-low action all the time. They're always looking for that, okay? That's, this is not a wasted pass. This swing. Turn your board. Other way. Other way. Like, yeah. Yeah. No, one more time. No. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. All right. That makes sense. <laughs> so appreciate you, coach. Yep. So this four to five, how low is always a look. All right. And then remember, like I told you, this two is bouncing off the baseline right here. That's a good time pass because sometimes, like if you play a Dean Walsh team, they're going to try to deny that. <laughs> so you can hit them with a good plant and back door, okay? A good plan and back door because now you ran them, bounced them off the baseline. They think they're going to get a steal. Plan and back door. And also, if they're a laser defender, that's a good way to get open rather than just standing there, okay? Because those are the easiest passes to pick off with somebody standing, okay? So the ball goes from here. Now the ball is on the two-man side. Everybody see that? Okay. Now, traditionally, what we did at Carolina, we always set this back pick, okay, for the trail post to go off. And that's an that's athletic big man or athletic player. That's a lob. Even if um, in girl, we ran it. I coach girls on the girls' side too, on the women's side, excuse me. You throw it, and if it's a big person, you throw a lob, they can catch it and finish it. All right? All right, now, the key in any break is once the ball is going from one side to the other, the defense has shifted, all right? And with our point guard, what I don't like, I don't like uh, to pull back and call plays. You should be able to go right into your offensive set right here. Now, we run a ball screen offense, so that five has followed the ball, uh, the four has went on the back screen, the three is now up here, one is on this side. Okay, everybody see that? All right, so now we go right into ball screen offense. 
She's driving off. He or she is driving off of here. All right. It's looking on this person to shift. Okay. They're looking screen and roll on that side. No help. Kick off. And then we go into another ball screen. So that's my offense. You don't have to use that offense. But it's just continuous. And we hadn't went back and called any sets. And we still got everybody moving. So we go until an extra ball screen. Now, Carolina, sometimes we didn't go into the ball screen. We went right into our motion. Okay. Or well, sometimes uh, I'm going over options now. If I go too fast, please ask questions because sometimes I get caught up in my own world. All right. Go ahead. So when you when you get ball screen, when they come off the ball screen on the that side, yep. And now they kick it over. What what action does that backside who just got rid of the ball, the post player and that wing, what backside action are they doing? Well that on? person, all right, so my bad. I didn't call that part. So the three that made that pass cuts through. Before they even go off the ball screen, the, the three cuts through ball side. Okay. This should be about elbow, this should be about foul line extended. Right. Foul line extended. The three is going to cut through to the corner and then they're going off. The one is on this side receiver. The one should be the only one over there. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So now you go off of here. Remember the four is over there as well. Kick to the one. Okay, because if you go off hard enough, this should, this this X should help. This defender should help. And then you kick, and then you just repeat the same thing. This four then goes, sets a ball screen. Okay, I'm going, I'm jumbling up a little bit. All right, like I said, I get a little too fast sometimes. All right, once the ball got kicked from side to side, the four now, five is screen and roll. Three, once it drove, the two, excuse me, drove, kick, goes corner, and then it's another ball screen. I love that offense. Okay. Yeah, this continues. Now, another thing, options. Options when you're running secondary. The main thing, same thing, big man, there you go. big man running the floor, got your wings on each side, Point guard pushing ahead, okay? Trailer. Now, if you have a shooter, if you have a shooter, kick it ahead, all right? Point guard trails, five still comes to the ball. You are going to swing. The ball goes from one side, again, back to the trail. Back to the trail, you still look at how low. Five follows the ball, swing to the three. Now, instead of the back screen, because this is what I did with uh, on the women's side a lot, because you're not throwing too many lobs. Sometimes you can, sometimes, if you don't have an athlete or if you don't have an athletic post player, okay? Now, instead of this guard who started the break, who, who, who uh, kicked it to first, they are going to get a double staggered screen. The point guard lined up here. Ball's been swung over here. Trail is right here. Five's right here. Point guard, two man or whoever's on the wing, goes and sets a screen. This two set your man up. Four. Coming right here, you have a double stagger on the back side. Okay? So now, also another option. Not called. Okay? Okay? The main, the main trigger for that, once you see that, this is uh, the point guard. All he does is signal, wave of the hand. He hadn't called nothing. That way they can't scout. He just says, hey, I got you. Throws it to him. That's the trigger that this guy is now going to get a double screen. Now, again, this is drilled every day. So it's not something you can just call on the fly because it's, it's within a secondary break. You teach those two options. You teach them to recognize it. 
and you get an option every time. Now, what happens is if you set in two good screens, this guy, this X guy up top will try to jump that if they know it's a shooter. I bet this person should be foul line extended. All right. And a lot of times what happens is this person will slip because this person jumps and you get a shot right there. You get a layup right there. Okay. If you're teaching them, uh, as uh, I think Coach Danielle said earlier, how to play basketball and not play plays. You teach them the blueprint. I always tell them this is the blueprint, but you learn to make reads. You learn to see how the defense is playing this. But if you drill it every single day, then they you'll be surprised. They will start seeing little options. Hey, Coach, what if I slip this ball screen? Hey, you think it's open? Go ahead. You build a trust with them. You start learning what they learn. You start seeing what they will pick up. So the more you drill it, the more uh, options come out of it. You get to the point where I can remember we played a game where I promise you we didn't run but four or five sets. We got 80% of our offense from the break. Just running, uh, getting looks, getting to the foul line, and getting open shots just from this. It was a beautiful thing to watch. But it's because this is pretty much the staple of uh, what I run because uh, the more you run sets, the easier you are to scout sometimes. Okay, now you got to have it. You got to have it. You got to have it. Not saying you don't teach sets, but the more you can get out of just the secondary break, which is literally keeping the fast break going from the primary break, before the defense sets up, uh, the better opportunities you'll have to score, the more creative you'll see your team become, and uh, the less stress you'll have in trying to figure out what set you want to run. It'll be, it'll be harder to scout, and uh, it'll be a lot of pressure on the defense. Hey, Ed. Hey, Ed. Yes. You have the rule. Yeah. Of your, the Carolina transition written. Do I have the rule? The rules. Uh, you know, the rules. Individual, you know, like your post. Rim, rim run, period. Don't worry about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Basic rules. I can no. have it. My team's visual, and we like okay. it. So now they oh, can absolutely. It. I can send it to you. I'd love to. I put my okay. info in the, the chat there because I, you know, if I give you my new note, Oops. I will give it to you. I, I have the rules. And if I if I look hard enough, I used to have uh, little diagrams. Because like you say, <laughs> you deal with a lot of <laughs> visual teams. Uh, and you I'll know, find that I'll send it to you. And you know, Sylvia, she did a lot of the same stuff that yes. Dean did too. So yep. I have a lot of her same philosophy, her being a, yep. a mentor. And, you know, so. But it's always good to have yeah. it in writing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I put it in, and, and like you said, she came from the same system. It's uh, inbred. It. In, <laughs> we can't. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in our head all the time. I don't think I could ever coach a team and not <laughs> teach the secondary break. Yeah, because I need to add that. Okay. Yeah, no doubt. Again, I appreciate you. Um, no problem, I'm gonna be, man. I'll be real brief because I know we've been on for a while. I'm going to be real brief in what I was going to talk about. I was going to talk pressure basketball and um, playing up tempo a little bit, pressure defense and up tempo. But my break looks similar to the um, secondary break or the Carolina break, as we call it. But I actually label my people a certain name and they have to run that lane every single time. It, mm -hmm. I just talked to Hank Gathers, his old coach at LMU. Mm -hmm. and just labeled him one, two, three, four, five. But I, I'm going to give you the names that I had for him, but they all made sense. So mm -hmm. my point about it obviously is, is the point. You don't change that. Mm -hmm. um, right. The man that takes it out is the trail. And then mm -hmm. I call the pipe. I call my rim runner a pipe. And mm -hmm. the reason I say that is because a pipe goes in a straight line. So I want my kids to run in that straight line because eventually the top is they're going to run the top off of the break. So then that now opens it up either. And I tell my point guard, throw it to the post player at least three or four times. I don't care if you turn it over, but I want the defense to honor that rim. Runner I, absolutely. Okay. That is the, that is the key, right? 
Yes, it's definitely the key. And, and um, something that I think added to that is because mm -hmm. how many times have you told your, your kids throw it, you got that pass going and they turn it over. Now all of a sudden they think they can't make that pass. Right. Tell, uh, this was huge from Coach Hatchell. Any turnover pre half court, in other words, I'm leading my break, I'm pushing, I'm going. And yeah, you're going to have mis mishandled passes at that time. Was not a bad turnover to her. But once it crossed half court, then take care of the ball. And her mm -hmm. philosophy was if she's getting 100 possessions, she turns it over 20 times, she still has 80 positive 80 possessions. Points. Which is yep. a lot. <laughs> That's a lot of money. It also teaches your kids not to be afraid to push the envelope and to challenge themselves and to get that post player, reward them, make them think, well, that gummit, I'm running faster than anybody. Why am I not getting the ball? Mm -hmm. So just wanted then, to add to that as a. No problem, coach. I appreciate it. Um, so, and then now my left wing and I give these players their name. They know where they're going when they get in. The left wing is called your diagonal. Why? Because most of my outlets are going to the right. And if the point guard makes that pass over the top to that left wing, it's a diagonal pass. Um, the, the right side is obviously the same side. But I think because I'm like Coach Walsh, and Ed knows this because he's seen my teams play, I am, I'm going to pick you up in the parking lot. You pull up, I'm in the parking lot waiting on you, and I'm going to put as much pressure as I can on you. I'm going, I'm going to trap ball screens. I'm going to double the post because if I can speed you up, number one, or I can put enough pressure on you, especially in the high school girls game, and even in the high school boys game, if I can put enough pressure on you and not allow you to be comfortable and play your game and run what you're comfortable running, I have a better chance of winning. And then that goes back to what Coach Wall said, that now creates extra possessions for me. My team's also offensive rebound like crazy. Um, Big Ed can attest to this. When I was at Liberty, um, we got 23 offensive rebounds in a game, and that's kind of unheard of for a high school team to get 23 offensive rebounds. We shot the ball poorly that game, but because of those 23 offensive rebounds, we got ourselves extra possessions. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. It, but the primary, and, and I'm going to be, like I said, I'm going to be short and brief. I'm gonna, this is probably the last thing I'm going to say, and then we can kind of dialogue. I'll take us off live, and we can just dialogue if y'all want. Um, the one thing that you can't, you have to get done is like coach said, which is why I'm interested in the stop chart. You have to get that initial stop or you can't run. If you're not getting a stop, there is no way that you can absolutely run. You can't run because you, you're not getting the stops that are needed. Okay. So that's, that's just my little tidbit of a little bit there, but um, Ed, and you can answer this coach Walsh. You can even answer this. There was a question that asked um, on your pitch ahead, do you want your point guard to go ahead and go to the corner since that is into your motion offense a little bit, or do you mm -hmm. see your point guard opposite after they pitch ahead? In, in my situation, you know, we did this at 11 this morning. Oof, it's a long time ago, but <laughs> it, it was. <laughs> we, are, we are drawing up X's on the floor. So, yeah. and me, the one through four lead the break. It may be my four man pitching. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> after that to get into our motion is fill one of those X's as long as there is spacing. And each one of those X's has 12 to foot, 15 foot spacing. Mm -hmm. so there is no wrong place to go. And it allows that freedom and less thinking, but we're skill drill. We're drilling it, drilling it, drilling it. So they know to go to any one of those spots. They can never be wrong. They're only wrong if they stand and watch. The only people that stand and watch are their parents in the stands. And that's where I put them. I don't put them on the bench. I said, go on up to the stands if I have to. Um, so that's the rule. Pitch ahead, one through four, go. And, again, our big rule is one hard push dribble to clear space and to read traps coming at you. Head up, reading. If there is somebody who's got – because our rule is also be three steps faster than your opponent. That's your mentality. So <laughs> if we're a step ahead, they are to pitch ahead, period. If it's a turnover, so be it. But it, you're not going to – it's going to get there faster. And it puts pressure on the defense to where – we do a drill at, we do a fast break off of free throws that this year half the teams we played quit putting people on the free throw line because mm -hmm. we were scoring. We, we drill it where we try to score within five seconds after a free throw. So it's, it's, we call it quickie and we are gone with that thing. So it's the mentality you breed. You may not score, but four or five possessions in that transition, but if you're doing it the whole game, it's like pressure. You keep putting pressure on a rock. What's it going to turn into? 
You know, mm-hmm. it's it's not going to be a diamond right away, mm-hmm. but at mm-hmm. the end of the game, it could be. So mm-hmm. I think that's what coaches, young coaches especially, they want that instant gratification like kids do. And as mm-hmm. old people realize, it's going to take time. And you just, you know, to learn the system, to understand the rules, you know, that's just my thought on that one. Uh, my, my picture here, uh, I, I I normally teach them to go to the corner, but like Coach Wall says, if they go opposite, everybody can fill in the spot. You know, long they, everybody knows what lanes, what spots have to be filled and where the ball is supposed to go. So even if somebody runs to the wrong spot, like Coach Wall said, if they're standing, I will go ballistic. Don't don't run to the wrong spot and then be like, oh, oh, that that ooh, you want to see me go crazy. That'll drive me crazy. But if they go to the wrong spot and they're still moving, we can adjust. You can always uh fill a spot. So well, coaches, I I really appreciate everybody who's participated in this at some point or another. Um I, it, it it warms my heart because it, I, like I say, I'm, I'm one of those I can talk basketball all day. I've, I've made Ed late and Ed's made me late. Um, Plenty we, of times. Plenty we, of times. We sneak in times. This guy holds me up at work every morning. <laughs> we sneak in times to talk and so on. <laughs> but we can still dialogue a little bit after the fact if you want. Um, I'm going to take us off live, but I really thank everybody who's watched, who presented tonight. Um mm-hmm. We need more of these, and I, I plan to have more. I'm, a, I'm, I'm looking to do one more and another one in about two weeks with more coaches. Um, then I'm going to do another one in another two weeks. As long as college coaches and high school coaches, as long as we're locked in and we can't get out and do anything, it, this is fun to have these dialogues. Might as well. This is a <laughs> yeah, love doing and, it. Yeah, and Coach Walsh is, you know, he's, he's gone. He's, we've developed a friendship, and he'll be – back on presenting again because I got a lot of stuff I'm gonna pick at him with. I pick at Ed every day. I talk to Antonio. We talk at least three or four times a day. Coach D, I'm about to talk to you now. But I thank all of y'all for real from the bottom of my heart. Um, And I thank everybody for tuning in. Give me one second.